What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And returning special guest Khalif Adams is back on the show. What up, ladies? How are you doing? I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me back. Absolutely. So the last time we saw you, Khalif, was back in March during the Game Developers Conference when you came and joined us here in studio to talk about all things GDC. We also talked about a lot of random stuff that episode, I feel <laughs> like. <laughs> that was, I think we, especially me, I was so hungover that, that because <laughs> we had a good night the night before in GDC. I remember we talked a lot about Sea of Thieves. There yes. were mentions of oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, uh, you know. Devil cookies. There was some oatmeal raisin cookie the devil's hate. Work. Hate. Yeah. I don't know. I just on the planet. I feel like I always get hoodwinked into eating oatmeal raisin cookies when I really want a chocolate chip cookie. Because I, I yeah. bet you, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that 98% of the people Ooh. listening to the What's Good Gains podcast, if given the opportunity to choose between chocolate chip and oatmeal raisin, would take chocolate chip. I feel like, yeah, because yeah. Like, chocolate chip is just a superior cookie. I agree with that. Now, uh, you know, as a person who <laughs> manages social media, I will say Khalif has an army of oatmeal raisin cookie warriors that like to come out and wield their pitchforks. But do they just also raisins. like oatmeal raisin cookies or do they think they are vastly superior to chocolate chip? Because I think I, that's the question. It's not that if you like both, it's would you go to bat for this cookie? Would you lay your life down for this oatmeal mm, raisin mm, cookie? Mm, I mean, mm. hell, I wouldn't lay my life down for oatmeal raisin cookies. <laughs> Good. That's mean, the right answer. I like them too, but not that much. <laughs> okay, so if you had to lay your life, you. if you had to lay your life down for a chocolate chip cookie or an oatmeal raisin cookie, which one? What? Which cookie would you prefer? I think that's the question. Here's the question: Is on? Oh. Okay, so you're going into, let's say, you're on death row. This is the yes. final cookie you get. What's yes. your choice? Okay. A nice buttery oh. classic chocolate chip cookie, or a disgusting dry. Gross oatmeal raisin cookie. <laughs> wow, on, look Simon. at that cookie. It doesn't have to be disgusting and dry. Zero bias. Zero bias. An question. oatmeal raisin cookie is like a graveyard for shriveled grapes. Oh my God, <laughs> this is unreasonable. This is not uh, fair. I apologize. I did not like know dirt. that it was going to go down this path. Uh, I, I believe that there is space in the universe for oatmeal raisin cookies. I just... <laughs> Categorically believe the chocolate chip is superior. Yeah, I feel like I came on the show and and all everyone is like having an ELE extension <laughs> level event about the cookie and yeah. wanted to see, wanted to see it gone from the face of the earth. I will we say, really only invited you back on here to shit on your cookie some more. <laughs> that's reasonable. I will take that. I'm okay with that in all forms and fashions. I will say, if I was on death row and I had to only have one cookie left in the world, it would be an orange Milano cookie. That oh. would be the only one that I would take to me before I have to like leave this planet. Okay, that'd be it. Milano, not a bad choice. Orange it's, it's, Milano, it's a real though. like snooty. That's a real cookie. fancy cookie. Fancy yeah. cookie. You fancy mm -hmm. chocolate and orange. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. mm, food. An mm -hmm. interesting combo. Well, now that we've talked enough about cookies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. It's episode sixty-eight of the What's Good Games podcast, and we have some PAX announcements to get to. If you're listening to this episode on Friday, August 31st, when it launches, that means it is the day of our amazing PAX West meet and greet party with Life is Strange 2. Uh, that is going to be an awesome event, and we hope to see lots of you folks out there in Seattle at Unicorn Bar. Again, you do not need a PAX badge to attend. You just need to be 21 years of age or older with a valid ID. It begins at 6 p.m. and goes until 9 p.m. The first 100 people in line will get free drink tickets. We're going to have free T-shirts, I believe, for almost everyone who comes in. Unless, like, we blow the place out again, which we hope we will. We've got lots of T-shirts. We've got custom Life is Strange pins. There'll be a photo booth where you can take pictures with your friends. They've digitized it. If you guys were at the event last year, you know they had like an old school traditional black and white photo booth that kind of took like three to five minutes to print your photos. <laughs> no more. They've upgraded uh, their, their new photo booth, which is really exciting. Plus, we're going to be uh, at the Expanding the Life is Strange Universe panel on Friday at 12 p.m., which will be streamed. I have all of the details for all of the panels. 
up on my website, and we're going to put it up on whatsgoodgames.com too. So I'll send Britt uh, that. But if you guys go to andrewrenee.com, all of those details are up. And then on Saturday, we've got a whole bunch of stuff happening at PAX, including the Just Cause just Cause 4 Showcase, uh, which is at 11 a.m., also live stream. Britt and Steimer are appearing on Red Dead Radio, The Path to Red Dead Redemption, the games on the path to Red Dead Redemption with Jared Petty. We've got Shadow of the Tomb Raider uncovering the hidden city of Pai Titi that I'm moderating at 4.30 p.m. And I will also be appearing in the kind of funny interwebsite video game tournament for the Bear Schneider Cup, uh, which yeah. is happening at 7 p.m. And I believe Mr. Khalif is also in that tournament. I'm taking everybody down. Everybody's yeah, going to lose are. except for me. Wait, are you, you guys? I was confused by the bracketing because uh, it was like so and so versus versus versus. And I I'm honestly like, have no idea how it's going to work. Greg That's, doesn't know either. We, yeah. He has no idea. All That's we know surprising. is that Human Fall Flat is uh, the announced game. <gasps> I think there are Britney. more games, but that's the only one that Greg's announced. So, uh, Britt, you're going to have to game. help me do a little practicing. <laughs> oh, my <laughs> God. Fall Flat. I don't know if you, anyone else has played Human Fall Flat, but I, I don't know if I've ever laughed harder at a game before. It's just the physics and ragdoll physics in that game. Hilarious. Also, all this information is at patreon.com slash what's good games. It's a public post. Oh, great. So Wonderful. That's excellent news. Um, and then, of course, Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at twitch.tv slash PAX2. If you guys are not going to be in Seattle, the What's Good Games live panel will be streamed. Uh, Khalif, you're doing some other cool things at PAX, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So we're, I'm doing a, a panel on Friday. Uh, it's called Hidden Gems. So we're going to be talking about some of the games that we like from the show. Uh, so that should be appearing on the show and where you can find them. I'll be there with Austin Walker and, and Felix Kramer and, and Dylan uh, Lavendo, uh, who's doing his thing over there. He put that together. Uh, Saturday, I'll be making my return, my triumphant return to the League of Heels. Kaka Beware will make another appearance in, nice. the, in the world of fake wrestling. Uh, and also uh, the kind of funny, kind of funny beat everybody's behind in all the games tournament. Uh, and also during Sunday, we'll be doing, uh, I'll be moderating the Indie Mega Booth panel uh, during that, uh, during that day. And then Saturday, back to Saturday, we're going to do uh, our first live show from PAX. So we're going to do a Spawn on Me live episode uh, from PAX for our 250th show. So congratulations. Uh yeah, awesome. it's going to be pretty, pretty dope. I'm super excited for it. I'm, like, really pumped for it. That is it awesome. 250 episodes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a lot. <laughs> it's been a long, almost five years. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, but it's been super, super cool. Uh, and and su I'm really excited for everybody to come out and uh, come hang with us during the show. We have a couple of guests. Blessing from uh, Blessing uh, Adieo from OK Beast. And Graham Pooh Bear, who is one of the best speedrunners on the planet, uh, he's going to be hanging out with us uh, during the show, too. So uh, come out 4.30 on Saturday uh, in the Sandworm Theater. So uh, come out and hang out. That's awesome. That yeah. is excellent. Bring um, him an oatmeal raisin cookie. He'll be happy. He'll he'll appreciate my cookies. I know. I'm so sad that your panel is scheduled over my Tomb Raider panel, so I can't come. Um, but I, I send you um, well wishes and another congratulations. That is not a small feat getting to 250 episodes. Super happy for you guys. Um, Thank you. And uh, we hope that you guys will participate. If you guys are at PAX, come find us. Say hi. Uh, rep your What's Good Games merch because that is who is sponsoring this week's episode. That's right. What's Good Games is brought to you this week by the What's Good Games merch store. So... I decided that I wanted to add a couple of pieces of merch to the store, uh, mostly selfishly because I wanted them. So we have a new legging design and new socks. So the socks are unisex uh, and they are kind of like a one size fits all. I don't know how this is going to work because some people have really small feet and some people have really big feet. So I, I ordered some pairs to try them out. But if you guys head on over to uh, teespring.com slash stores slash what's good games, or if you go to what's good games.com, you can find the link to the merch store. You can find our new legging design with our what's good games controller icon. And that is the same design that is also on the new socks. If you guys haven't picked up a what's good games t-shirt yet, now is a great time to do so. Um, it's going to be awesome. And we have lots of cool designs there. Not only do we have the That's What She Said pillow that Britt has on her set right now. We've got the Baby Ass Baby Mode shirt. There you go. Yes, please Vanna that for me. Um, nice. We've got <laughs> the Goodbye Forever shirt. 
we've got nerdy for narrative and a bunch of other cool stuff so we hope you guys check that out it does help us every little bit helps and it's something cool that you can wear and, and show your friends um i do want to make a mention i know that um that Khalif mentioned the paxamania pax rumble what is it on now don't know um <laughs> we were invited the credit union was invited to make an appearance at the show we unfortunately had to decline because at the time that um, Pat, Pat Bear, who runs the Bear Cave, um, asked us to be involved, we thought that our big event uh, that we're partnering with Square Enix on was going to be held on Saturday night. And so we declined and then we found out that we were moving the event to Friday night and it was too late for us to go back in. So uh, we are going to be rooting everybody on. I believe Johnny Casanova is going to be making an appearance. Um, and uh, it's the first time you guys are doing this event in the evening, which almost never happens. It's at uh, yep. 8.30 p.m. We are always used to those brutal early Sunday mornings. <laughs> and now that's when our <laughs> panel is. <laughs> I, might yeah, bring my, I might bring my Britcoin shirt just for shits. You should cheer from the side. <laughs> Bitcoin will return. Yeah. Hashtag Bitcoin will return. Mm. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into some news. So this week has been kind of a doozy. There was a uh, Nintendo Direct. There was um, a bunch of stuff from Microsoft. Um, and so let's go ahead and get started. So I just kind of pulled... Um, the roundup that we did on Kind of Funny Games Daily for the Direct. So I'm not going to read all of this, but if you guys missed it, Nintendo did a Nindies mini Direct of all the Nindies. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them that are going to be showing at PAX West this weekend. And just to kind of announce some release dates for up-and-coming games. The first thing I, I noticed after the Direct was over was that I... I was wishing that there was going to be more new announcements instead of just games that had been on previous platforms that they've ported to Switch. But that being said, there's still quite a bit here. So I'm just going to read a little bit. The ever-growing community of talented and independent developers sees the benefit of releasing creative games on the versatile Nintendo Switch, a system that can be played at home or on the go, said Steve Singer, the vice president for Nintendo of America's publisher and developer relations team. We are happy to support their work and contributions on our platform as we further grow our strong relationship. So here are some of the games that are coming to Nintendo Switch. Uh, Into the Breach, Hyper Light Drifter, Tower Fall, Treasure Stack, Zarvat, Mineco's Night Market, Samurai Gun 2, The World Next Door, Level Head, King of the Hat, Untitled Goose Game. Plus, <laughs> I know that game looks so good. Plus, we've got The Messenger, Bastion, Wasteland 2, The Director's Cut, Undertale, Lightfingers, Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery EP, Jackbox Party Pack 5, Transistor, Desert Child, and Dragon Mark for Death. So these are all the ones that have been listed, um, and you guys can find out individual details if you there's a game that you're more curious about by watching that direct yourself uh we had a question a dear wgg from mr chris lavornia who asked which upcoming indie game are you most excited for brit nah. the goose untitled goose game was that a good goose <laughs> <laughs> it was more like a kind of like a donkey goose yeah you're yeah, right that's, that's a good point I don't know what the hell hybrid that was. But yeah, Untitled Goose Game. It looks like a, a game where you go around and just kind of bother people. The whole point is just be a very bad goose and make everyone's day a living hell. And I think that sounds so fun. <laughs> and it looks so silly that uh, I think it's awesome. Now, is the is the name of the, the game literally Untitled Goose Game? I think I so. so. Yes. I've, I think so. I think that is amazing. I'm down for that. I am very That's down for that. That's the one I'm going to buy out of all of these. Steimer, none of the other ones are exciting to you? Just a lot of them are, like you mentioned, repeat stuff. So, and I know this one is too, but like, I don't know. That darn goose. Look at him messing up people's gardens and being a little troublemaker. <laughs> Khalif, I'm any of these stand out for you? Uh, I'm happy Desert Child is going to be out there. Desert Child is really, really fun. I kept, kept seeing it at the uh, Indie Mega Booth and at... Uh, um, a couple of smaller shows, and to see that that's going to make it to the Switch is going to be really cool. The game's going to be fun. The other game that I'm interested in is I'm probably is it Mineko? 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 Mineko's Night Market. This so looks really this kind of yeah, this kind of looks like a mix between Story of Season, Stardew Valley, A Night in the Woods, and um, uh, a dragon or like a store management sim. 
because you it, it looks like you go around and you like raise cats like you see this what? little character you, like <laughs> like it's like a like harvest moon story of seasons you see a field full of cats like they look like little cabbage cats oh and my she, god like, they're so cute yeah, yeah yeah and you walk up to one of them and she just like plucks it out and it's like okay you just grew a cat out of a leaf <laughs> that's pretty cool and then it shows her at night managing the shop and there's like I think they said 20 hours of gameplay. There are different characters to meet and things to do. And so I'm, that sounds like such a weird, bizarre concept that I'm totally into it. I am all about that. Oh, this looks super cute. Yeah, it I looks, know. It looks I, super I, cute. Um, it says it's a game that celebrates Japanese culture while introducing a heartwarming story about friendship, tradition, and many, many cats. Andrea, I feel like that is something you would like. I know, but the, this gameplay is not necessarily something that's up my alley, but I look at the wear cat. my cat shirt today. If you guys are watching at <laughs> youtube.com slash what's good games, you would see it. Um, so <laughs> it, the word cat alone will at least be like, hmm, I'll take a look. I'll take a look at it. Mm -hmm. You should look uh, at the cats that you grow. Um, Hyper Life, Hyper Light Drifter also. I have never played that. I know it came out in what, 2016 on other yeah. consoles. And it's described as a Diablo and Link to the Past game. Have any of you played it? No. Okay. Mm -mm. I thought you were going. <gasps> no, sorry. I'm looking at a different game because I'm starting to open some of the ones that sound unfamiliar to me. And oh. there's one called The World Next Door, which is like an action That's adventure puzzle game. But it also seems like there is flirting in here, which I am very into. It's a Shout very different game about that follows a rebellious teenage girl trapped in a parallel world inhabited by magical creatures coming out early 2019 to Nintendo Switch. Yeah, and so you can respond differently. But the one part of that kind of turned me off was the battle system or is it's real puzzle-based. Puzzle yeah, but that's, I mean, I'm sure it could. But Andrea would actually like that. But I'm not Andrea. No, I know. Sure. But I'm like, hey, You're Andrea, I, Brit, I, I wish a game I you might like. But no, that one does look really cute. Also, she's got a cute crop top and I want it. I gotta give a shout out to the folks over at the World Next Door because they're from Portland. It's Pid uh, Portland Indie Game Squad, so Pig Squad represent who made that game out there in the world. So shout out to them. That's gonna be a fun game too. Yeah, yeah this game cool. also reminded you me of you, Simer, because there's a reputation system. You can answer questions differently, and I know that's kind yes. of yes. Right. I saw the I saw the flirt death. emoji, the like kissy face. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. Dragon marked for death. I am all about that game too. December thirteenth. Oh. So far away. I mean, it's, okay. it's not. That's totally but... fine. Honestly, it could come like next year at some point. That's what she said. And I'd be totally happy because I have more than enough stuff to keep me occupied for the rest of 2018. <laughs> that's no, so There is a yeah. lot. Wait, what? A princess is a DPS character. Hell yeah. Nice. I want to be. I don't like it when they're like, the princess is the healer. Like, no, I want to stab someone. <laughs> <laughs> which is why I appreciate Primrose and Octopath, which we can talk about later. Princess Stabity Stab, Alistair quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to find out more about the games coming to the Nintendo Switch, you can check out oh, that new direct. Real quick, the new <laughs> channel coming. That's going to be good for discoverability to the Nintendo Switch, which is oh, a good yes. thing. Uh, the yeah. news channel. Uh, I think that that is... Um, I think it definitely ties in with what they were talking about earlier in the year about wanting to bring more independent games to Switch. And I know that that was kind of divisive, that some people were very excited about that because the Switch is their primary console. And other people were like, well, I feel like they're just putting games on the platform just to have a bigger library and not necessarily curating them. To which I had said, well, look at how many games are on Steam or on PSN or on Xbox Live. Like, there's tons of games. That's, there's room on Switch for more indie games, and this is a good way for them to kind of highlight some of their staff picks with this yeah. new channel. So. I just want yeah, those games like to be Yeah, like the staff picks reasonable. in the bookstore. Yeah, exactly. All right, moving on to the next story. This one is from Microsoft. Now, this is a really interesting one. Microsoft is going to offer 24-month financing plan for Xbox One, and this comes via Game Informer. So this story was rumored uh, a few days before Microsoft went ahead and confirmed it. And I'm just going to read from the article in Game Informer. Today, Microsoft announced a new way for potential customers to buy Xbox One X with a financing plan that Microsoft itself is putting together called Xbox All Access. 
Purchasers of the plan get access to the following. An Xbox One, either an S or an X, 24 months of Game Pass, 24 months of Xbox Live. The Xbox One S plan will cost $21.99 a month for 24 months, while the plan for an Xbox One X will cost $34.99. No games are offered with the plan, but the subscription to Game Pass gives you access to what Microsoft says is, quote, 100 all-you-can-play games for as long as you have the subscription. You can get the full details, of course, over at Major Nelson's blog, but I think that this is something that's really kind of fascinating. Obviously, the idea of a lease or paying monthly installments for technology is nothing new. Cell phones have been doing this for quite a while, but we haven't really seen consoles do this yet, especially with it bundled with the digital subscription service of Xbox Game Pass. And I know that the rumors had said that they were going to also include Xbox Live Gold in the past price, but it does not appear that that's the case. Um, Ka, do you think that this is going to maybe bring people into the Xbox ecosystem that have been hesitating? This is the smartest thing I've seen them do in a long time when it comes to trying to snag people and get people back into the fold, where they are still trying to figure out kind of a little bit of the identity that they want to kind of put out in the world with Xbox Scarlet being a thing supposedly out there that may be, <laughs> may be coming uh, the kind of, you know, all in one streaming box thing that they want to kind of put out into the world too. It still feels like they're trying to figure out exactly what they want to give to uh, give to consumers. And I feel like this is an easy way to grab people and say, okay, we're going to figure out a way to get you in. And once you're in, you're going to want to stay. So here's a thing that you don't have to think about. It'll be a monthly payment. You figure out what that payment will be. Um, and then you'll just push forward and kind of make sure that, um, you know, you have the offerings that you're looking for in the space with the Game Pass. You already have games ready for you. Um, and you'll already have a, a whole bunch of offerings on both sides where you have the kind of smaller S and you have the Xbox One X as well. So you can get into there. Uh, any way that you run it, any way, any kind of budget that you want to kind of mm -hmm. hit at. So um, it'll be really fun to see how that actually plays itself out and if people kind of go with it. Uh, and if they do uh, uh, kind of push forward and kind of get that market share that they've been looking to get for a while. And I yeah. want to clarify before you make a comment, Brittany, that I went to Major Nelson's side just to double check. It does include Xbox Live Gold. So it's 0% APR for 24 months. So that's important. They're not charging you interest. It's mm. Xbox Game Pass and Xbox Live Gold. Uh, and you get the one terabyte Xbox One S or Xbox One X, depending on the plan that you choose. I've just been sitting here scribbling, doing math to try and figure out like I whether have, or not I already this. got it ready. Bit and then I was like, oh, this is more expensive. But now if it has gold, it's not. Never mind. Yeah. So if you do the Xbox One S deal, the total comes to $840 that you'll pay. But the actual price of that would be $860. So you're... Saving 20 bucks. Uh, well, also, actually, that's the Xbox on, One X. on Major Nelson's site, they call it a savings of over $130 if you get the S, the $21.99 per oh. month plan for 24 months. Okay, so then maybe this article did, though. I mean, I'm not claiming to do the math because I didn't. I grabbed it from, I think it was Polygon. But either way, yeah, well, according to Polygon, the if you save for 20 bucks when you do the Xbox One X and when you get the Xbox One S – you save like $62 overall. But if you save more than that, that's wonderful. But yeah, because I've heard people say, well, why wouldn't I just get a credit card and, <laughs> you know, just do this myself? Have that's Apple why. Financing. Yeah. Exactly. And you do save money in the long term. Now, you do have to go through Dell Financial Services to get the credit for this. And you obviously do Whoa. need to apply. And this offer is valid from August 27th until December 31st. And you have to go to a Microsoft store in person to apply for this but with all that said i still think this is awesome i mean you need to go look what microsoft is offering they have xbox all access they have cross-platform play they have backwards compatibility they have this game pass shenaniganry this is an awesome awesome offering i think and now if these new studios that they've acquired that we saw about at uh, that we learned about at e3 start pumping out exclusives i think they have an awesome awesome next generation ahead i'm excited to see how that goes for them yeah, I think the financing deal is really interesting and, and cool. And I think it'll be even better if they like kind of continue this moving forward. So whenever the next box launches, maybe this plan is just already there. And it's like, yes, now we just continue this with whatever the new thing is. And it's a little bit more because like that's what's going to get people in because it's really hard to drop 
buy like over five hundred dollars on a thing, um, because there's tax and there's all this other crap. Um, but it's a lot easier to be like, well, I just now I pay thirty five bucks a month. Mm-hmm. And you're like, yes, that is something I can stomach. Totally, thanks. Is great. It's smart. They need to sell more consoles. They need to get more of their consoles in homes, and this is great. I've, I mean, this is cool. I don't think there's ever been a deal like this before in the industry. Yeah. I can't think. Yeah, not, not that one that I can deal, think of yeah. either. Um, I do want to take a look at the fine print of these agreements because anybody out there who's ever applied for credit knows there's a ton of fine print. So, of course, if you're considering this, make sure that you do your due diligence and read through all of the terms and conditions of the agreement. But at, on face value, it looks like a, a really good thing that Xbox is offering for people who you know, want to get into the Xbox ecosystem but have been really you know, prohibited because of the cost. So this is cool. I'm excited to see where this goes and to see if maybe some of the other hardware makers are inspired by this or see that Xbox is successful with it and maybe they offer plans like this maybe for PlayStation or Nintendo Switch. Yeah. That'd be good. Mm. More games for everyone. Yay, games for everybody. Um, (laughs) Before we get to... um, we, We also want to talk about the events that happened in Florida. But before we do that, I'm going to kind of save that really heavy piece of news for the end of the block. Um, I didn't write it in here, but I'm going to talk about it now. I'm going to jump to Cyberpunk 2077. So we talked about this game uh, a lot after E3. Uh, All three of you got to see the demo at E3. I did not, but now I've gotten to see, you know, this meaty piece of gameplay, 48 minutes that they have released from CD Projekt Red. And boy, oh boy, did a lot of you (laughs) write in about it. Um, Before we uh, get to that, I'm going to pull up the uh, statement uh, that was made by CD Projekt Red about this release and why they released it. Because I thought that it was um, kind of interesting. So um, Adam Badowski said, What we're releasing today was recorded from a game deep in development. He, of course, is the game director at CD Projekt Red. Quote, since many of the assets and mechanics in the current version of Cyberpunk 2077 are most likely to be modified, we initially decided to show this gameplay only to media. Elements like gunplay, both in terms of visuals and how RPG stats influence it, net running, car physics, and the game's UI, everything's pretty much still in the playtest phase, and we felt uneasy about publicly committing to any particular design. Animation glitches, work-in-progress character facial expressions, early versions of locations, all this made us hesitant to release what you're about to see. However, we are also well aware that many of you want to see what the media saw. Although this is probably not the same game you'll see on your screen when we launch, we decided to share this 48 minute video with you. This is how Cyberpunk 27, 2077 looks today. Let us know what you think. And from what I've seen on social media, the response has been overwhelmingly positive. It's very clear why this game caught the eye of so many members of the press at E3. But um, I want to hear from you three. You guys saw the demo, and clearly this is not like shot for shot the demo that you saw because it was was it obvious when you were watching the demo that someone was doing a live playthrough, or did it feel like some of the sections were pretty scripted? Oh, man. I'm tra- uh, that was like two whole months ago. Yeah, it was like, oh, God. <laughs> um. It ran really smoothly, so, like, it mm-hmm. could have... I don't know. I was like, this could go either way. <laughs> um, I don't... I think they did at one point... Eh, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't really think too much about it. I was very hungover. It was very early in the morning. <laughs> it, it felt really scripted to me. Like, they had set up everything and kind of let people kind of just run through it. They had recorded a bunch of it and kind of just let people go through the levels and, and kind of talked over it. Um, but, yeah, it, it, if it was being played live, I wouldn't have known. It, it didn't seem like there were enough things that you would normally see of people like messing up or like not getting a shot off in the right spot or, you know, some of those things you kind of just already see in a, in a, in a live demo uh, to make me feel like it was. But, you know, somebody could have been really good and been playing that thing forever. Yeah, uh, so we don't yeah, know. That's their one job. Is playing that's the <laughs> exactly. That's their one job. And when we did see it, Samer, I think it was the last day of E3. So they had obviously yeah. ran through a whole lot of demos. And I mean, looking back on it, there's no fluff. I mean, I don't know how these demos are programmed, so it might sound real dumb here. But I imagine, you know, they have the enemies placed in a very specific place so they can show you the moves. I remember when they showed the bullet ricocheting off the corner, Sam, you're like, oh, that's so cool. And, you know, that wasn't an accident that that was shown to us. Yeah, um, like, if if he had messed up that shot, I would have been like, oh, this is a live gameplay demo. But, like, since 
that you're right. Like the enemy is like where he was supposed to be. And like, you didn't mess up the billiards math in order to pull off the shot. Cause I would probably mess that up quite a bit. I'm not very good at pool. Um, <laughs> I will not be using that gun, <laughs> but uh, it's a neat concept for people who do have better, you know, Spatial awareness, I suppose. Spatial awareness. I like this comment from Molle. She said, oh my God, Cyberpunk 2077, what did you think? I think I feel that sound Britt makes when she thinks about Resident Evil. The <laughs> sound. So Andrea, <laughs> you got to see it. What this is you your first time seeing it? Because I think yeah. we've all, or at least Britt and I have spoken about it before. I think it looks really cool. I love how deep the character customization looks like it's going to go. And uh, I like the styling of this universe, this, you know, kind of high tech, futuristic, um, you know, kind of bleeding edge, cool kind of a vibe. I think that that's really awesome. I think that CD Projekt Red has shown that they know how to do living open worlds uh, based off what we've seen with The Witcher. And I'm interested to see who some of these characters are that you'll meet along the way. I, I don't know why for half of a second I was like, man, there's a lot of nudity right in the beginning of this demo. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, it's CD Projekt Red. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, like, obviously they even called it out in the narration that they that this is a mature game and it's going to have, you know, a lot of dark, mature themes. And clearly there's going to be sex and nipples and all kinds of other things in this game, um, which is like. I never want that to be like the takeaway, but it was just like the first thing that stood out to me. But I was like, man, those nipples look really well drawn. Somebody put some time into them. Um, <laughs> but it, it, I don't want to get nipples. too far down that path. I mean, it looks it looks good. I like the idea. <laughs> what? what? I don't want to go too far down that path. Talk about the well drawn nipples on the characters in Cyberpunk 2077. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I I like the idea that the choices you make will um, kind of have a ripple effect throughout your gameplay. I like that, you know, you get to have these narrative choices because not enough games, I think, will let you do that. It really helps you feel more immersive. It was interesting hearing some of the narration about some of the gameplay design choices that, that they made and how they chose a first-person shooter perspective. Well, really, first person, I want to just call it a shooter. It's clearly much more than that. Um, but how they wanted that to really make you feel immersed in the world. Now, it's kind of a bummer because you're going to go through this cool create a character process and then you're not going to see your character except in cutscenes. A la Destiny. Yeah, well, hopefully there'll be more <laughs> cutscenes than in Destiny. Um, but um, it's um, yeah, it looks really good. Um, it's, it's, it's concerning that so many people were like, this is my game of show when CD Projekt Red themselves have come out to say the game, it might not look like this at launch. And I'm like, this is why we don't rate games this early on. You know, we yeah. take a look at Especially like a, very, like a, I don't care if it was a live playthrough, it's still scripted. Also should probably just close it at one point I worked for CD Projekt Red. Also just heads up. Um, I obviously didn't make any, like I'm not a developer. <laughs> I made none of this. Um, but I did know that, like the game was going to be first person before anybody else did. Like I kind of knew a lot of the things about it. Um, and I still stand by this and I will keep hitting my drum on this. I did not enjoy the dialogue of that demo whatsoever. I did not enjoy that almost hour that I sat there because to me, it just felt really um, forced. Forced. Yeah. And it didn't feel uh, authentic to me at all as like to what, these characters would be talking like it sounded like what somebody thought these characters should be talking like and thus about them as a person and what their motivation would be um and i know people are like i've read i've read a lot of threads on the internet about like how nitpicky apparently that is but i'm like this is a <laughs> hundred hour or plus possible you know that's how long i spent in witcher possibly more i don't actually know um and so for you to tell us that it's not a reasonable critique is odd because that's what you're going to be listening to for a very long time. <laughs> no, it's such a good point because I hardly ever pick. I've n I don't know if I've ever complained about the dialogue or something, anything like that in a game before. It's just not something I'm super in tune with or I pick up on. But even like Simon, I was very hungover that morning. But even me, like towards the end of that, like, I'm like oh God, like that's just something about it was off. I don't know if it was the pitch of her voice or if it was maybe it was the written dialogue, like you were saying. And that honestly is the one concern I have with this game going forward is 
if this isn't approved upon or if something isn't changed, that could suck. Now, granted, maybe if we start the game from the beginning, we get to know this character, it might make more sense and we might yeah. be more attached where it won't be an issue. But as of right now, it's just one of those things. It's interesting to hear other people pick up on that. I didn't, it didn't bother me. I'm going to be honest. Like the, the VO, the delivery of the lines, even though it kind of felt a little campy and over the top, the way some of it was written. Um, I've met people who talk like that in real life. So um, it wasn't something for me that was really bothersome to me. I also didn't mind Dinklebot in original destiny and a lot of people <laughs> hated him. And so I think it's, um, it can be a very, uh, subjective point of view. If somebody's performance in a, in a game or a movie or TV show or whatever, either rubs you the wrong way or it doesn't. That being said, I think it's obviously something that's been prevalent in, in feedback. So they should take a hard look at it. If a significant amount of the audience who has watched the demo, whether it be members of the public or members of the media, have given that feedback, it should at least give them pause to go, you know, we don't necessarily need to change it, but we should probably take a look at what what's happening here and why people are making mm -hmm. this complaint. We have a couple of people that wrote in. Brandon Gion, uh wrote in, gone? Gan? Wrote into Dear Fine. WGG and said, This week the public finally got a tiny taste of what Cyberpunk 2077 will be like with CD Projekt Red stream on Monday. And while I absolutely loved what I saw, I'm curious to the timing. While making a behind closed doors demo available to watch later down the line is not unique, I'm a little surprised it's only two months since it was first shown to E3 attendees. So my question, how do you feel CDPR chose now to showcase the the footage thank you for taking my question if you do have a yeah. wonderful rest of your day um i think the timing is um the reason why it's now is because now gamescom has finished and i know that they were doing some demos of this at gamescom last week so it would make sense that they don't want to negate anybody's time with the demo uh but that took it the time to see it in person by <laughs> releasing it to the public and obviously the demo you saw behind closed doors isn't identical to the thing that they've released to the public. But I'm sure a ton of their fans have been beating down their digital door to be like, show us, show us, show us. And so they probably had no choice but to release something. Now, I didn't anticipate them releasing something as long as they did. I expected them to cut it in half to something more in the 20 minute range. Um, but it was inevitable that they were going to release this at some point because clearly their team put a lot of work into preparing this demonstration of the game making these vertical slices is not a small feat and I'm sure they wanted the, to get as much legs out of it as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And doesn't city project red always include little letters in their games where they're like, Hey, thank you so much for playing our game. I feel like they do whenever I've opened a Witcher game. Uh, it's just <laughs> kind of that level of transparency that I feel like city project red, red has. And I feel like they're respected because of it. So if there were to, if there was going to be a studio that was going to release footage like this, I'm not surprised that, they did. Now, are they saying release date just 2019? Is that what's been said? I don't think there's a release window at all for this game. I don't think they've said. No, nope, not yet. Okay, that I'm leads into Google another good shit. question, Britt. Samuel Root says, hey, WGG, just watched the Cyberpunk gameplay stream and couldn't be more pumped to play the game. What are the chances this game will be cross-gen? Personally, I 100% believe it will be. Anyway, keep up the good work. Much love, Sam, a.k.a. Blind Archangel. Cross gen, I'm, you think? I don't. Uh, given what they're talking about, what they want to do with the tech, I don't think so. I don't know. Like the no loading screens in a world that is as large as they are talking about and as dense as they are talking about. I don't know if that's possible on current generation hardware, um, because that's very difficult to do. If you've played any open world game, there's usually loading screens in some place. Uh, so obviously things will be hidden, but it's, uh, just like the way they were talking about the tech, I would be surprised if they could get, I mean, maybe they can just optimize it and make the graphics worse. I don't know, but I'm not yeah. an engineer. <laughs> yeah. So the only thing we have about a release date comes back to, um, December of 2016 city project red was given sizable funding from Polish government to research new game techniques. That grant came with a deadline by which time the projects must be completed. Um, assuming therefore cyberpunk and they have to be, there has to be a cyberpunk 2077 release date in June, 2019. That's not happening. Yeah. There's June. I don't think that that could be well. Shit. So, wait, no, yeah, they're going mean, to have like, to revise that somewhere. 
Okay, so yeah, it looks like this article is from PC Games, and it was just published ten hours ago. But it sounds like they could be on the books or be contractually. Wait, but just because there was a loan in twenty sixteen. In twenty sixteen, it sounds like they were given funding, and part of that funding was contingent upon the game coming out in June twenty nineteen. But they didn't say reads. that the funding was for Cyberpunk. It just says it's for a game. It's, it could be Gwent. You, you're, you're totally right. right but... What but I think you, you both talked at the same time. I oh, I said it could what... be Gwent too, for all we know. That's true. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like Gwent released, I think, after 2016. Oh, will Gwent two be on the next console? <laughs> that's the real question that we need to figure out. Will there be loading screens in Gwent two? Probably. <laughs> Damn okay, it. so in February 2016, an investor call suggested Cyberpunk 2077 this is February 2016 would be released by 2019. Clearly not happening. CD Projekt Red said it's planning to release two AAA RPGs between 2016 and 2021 and confirmed on the CD Projekt forums that Cyberpunk 2077 will be the first to come out. So, yeah. We have nothing. <laughs> Confirmed. Shrug. Confirmed. Confirmed. Yeah. Okay. We'll see. I mean, I, I'm hoping it comes out sooner than later, but I'm also like, take as much time as you need to make sure that that game is good and I feel figure like, out what you need to do. I feel like Gwent may have counted towards that release from 2016 mm -hmm. because it released in 2017. Well, technically it's not out, but, or is it now? I don't know. I don't pay attention to Gwent anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my question to all of you is, do you feel like they did themselves a disservice by still showing it to folks out in the world when they know it's not going to look like what it looked like today in another six months from now, like six to eight months, maybe even a year? Do you feel like they did themselves a disservice with that? I mean, yes and no, because like you have to keep people you can't just be like, sorry, we're not showing you even more. Like it's been a lot. This game has been a long time coming. Um, so they needed to show them something. Did they need to show them all 48 minutes of it or whatever the hell it is? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's smart of them, too, to be like, yes, there are press, but you, our fans, are still our bread and butter. Like, you are our number one. And so, therefore, like, you get nearly, not exactly the same, but nearly the same thing that they got because they are not more important than you. You are a customer. You are important. And I think that that's what they definitely try to do a lot with their communications. Mm. Yeah, I agree with Steimer. I think if they hadn't released this footage, I think the fans would have... What do you mean? Why can't we look at the footage? I don't know. Not all fans talk that way. I'm sorry. I'm a fan too. I, <laughs> but I do actually talk that way. So never we mind. We all have Muppet voices. It's we okay. all have Muppet voices. Yeah, but like she was saying, I think if they hadn't released that, it could have caused them... I don't know if bad blood. That's a little too dramatic. But, uh, you know, like I said, I feel like CD Projekt Red has been pretty transparent and they do seem like one of the humble studios that thank their fans for buying their products. So it makes sense for them to do that. I don't know. I don't know if other studios would have felt the same sort of pressure or felt the same sort of obligation to do this. And they also had some bad press the week before. So I think this was really, this is a good time to throw out some goodwill stuff. Oh, I there's a few bones. That. Yeah. For them to be like, Oh yeah. So we totally botched that thing last week. So this week, everyone gets cyber. This week here. Footage. Don't All look the at things. the man behind the curtain. No. Look at this listen. beautiful demo we have given you. <laughs> With this terrible Spanish. Aren't we nice? Aren't we the best? Classic the best, bait and right? switch. Classic, classic bait and switch. Smart, though. I mean, I'm not yeah. going to say that that's what that was, but it was good to put that, that stuff out around the same time that something bad happened because then people will forget. Oh, yeah. yeah. Funny how that works. <laughs> yeah. People True are words were never spoken. Um, I may be looking accidentally at a battery op operated butter sprayer don't know how that what? popped into my window right what? now while i'm trying to look at my show notes but now that was a very that. cyberpunk thing to do i know you stick a you stick a thing of butter or a, a stick of butter inside of it and you can press a button and it sprays it like a, oh, i can't believe it's not butter spray. yeah yeah just like that but like real butter can. It's like a butter fan. Okay, wait. Now we got to analyze this. So the butter, I'm assuming, melts. And yeah. Then it can be there's a heating the element top. inside. People are fancy these days. <laughs> I know. It's like, it's right? like butter mace. Why? Why? Butter mace. <laughs> Back, thief. Khalif. Back up off me. Khalif. I'm like, with was delicious. Like, licking his face. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Delicious butter makes my pores nice. On my forehead. So All right. Well, now it. I have to make the most awkward of transitions into oh, a very yeah. serious story. Um, mm -hmm. Something that, you know, I contemplated, you know, should we talk about this? Should we not talk about it? A lot of people have been obviously 
giving their thoughts and opinions on the events that happened in Jacksonville last weekend. And of course, our hearts go out to everybody affected by the shooting at the Madden tournament. Just as a short recap, if you somehow haven't gotten any of the details, um, three are dead, including the suspect at a shooting at a Madden tournament in Florida. This write-up comes via Polygon. At a competitor competition in a Madden NFL 19 tournament in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, someone opened fire during the event on Sunday, killing two people before taking his own life, according to police. At a news conference Sunday evening, Sheriff Mike Williams of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office identified the shooting suspect. Williams said that the suspect was at the Madden tournament as a competitor and that he shot and killed multiple people and then fatally shot himself. Following a second news conference on Monday afternoon, the sheriff's office said that the authorities had identified the two deceased victims as other competitors in the Madden tournament. 22-year-old Elijah Clinton of Woodland Hills, known in the esports community as True Boy, and Taylor Spot Me Please Robertson, who is 28, of Giles, West Virginia. So a very sad day, sad weekend, sad week um, for the gaming community, really kind of rocked by gun violence and the horrible and tragic events that happened in Jacksonville. Um, in response to this, there have been a couple of things that have happened. Um, EA has made, a, has made an official response. Um, CEO Andrew Wilson came forward and said, quote, while these qualifying events uh, in response to um, EA canceling the rest of the Madden Classic qualifiers, while these events are operated independently by partners, we work with them to ensure competitive integrity and to gather feedback from players. We have made a decision to cancel our three remaining Madden Classic qualifier events while we run a comprehensive review of safety protocols for competitors and spectators. We will work with our partners and internal teams to establish a consistent level of security at all of our competitive gaming events. Of course, questions about security at gaming events and esports tournaments have sprung up in the aftermath of the shooting. PAX West organizers offered this statement about increased security measures to Polygon ahead of the convention this weekend. Quote, the safety of our attendees, exhibitors, and staff is paramount to Reed Pop and Penny Arcade. As enforcement and other personnel, each of whom are on site at all times during our events, PAX has grown in popularity. I skipped a sentence there, my fault. As PAX has grown in popularity, we have responded with the addition of increased private security, law enforcement, and other personnel. As a rule, we do not publicly announce or discuss the details of our security program in order to maintain its effectiveness. However, we work closely with the Washington State Convention Center Private Security, the Seattle Police Department, and federal law enforcement authorities authorities to identify risks, assess them, and develop our comprehensive security protocols for PAX West. We have in place extensive proactive measures, some that are visible during PAX events and many that are not. We are always working to improve our security plans and if need be, adjust them to ensure that we are doing all that we can to make PAX West and all PAX events a safe and secure environment for the community. Across the 15 years of PAX events, we have provided a safe and welcoming environment for more than a million attendees to come together for their love of gaming, and we are ensuring that we adhere to that tradition at PAX West 2018. Uh, Wilson did not suggest if the three remaining Madden Classic qualifier events would take place at a later date, but reiterated the focus is on investigating safety precautions and working closely with the families of Elijah Clayton and Taylor Robertson, who were killed in the shooting. Quote, we are committed to supporting Taylor and Elijah's families through this difficult time, and we send our deepest sympathies to their loved ones, to those injured, and everyone affected. You can see Wilson's full statement on EA's website. Um, also, I want to make a note that in response to the events in Jacksonville, at our event, we have also increased security from what we had originally planned. So we hope that everybody who comes to our event will feel that they can celebrate in safety and not have to be afraid. Um, this is a really hard thing to talk about because I think it hits close to home in a way that I personally haven't had to feel before. Like I had people reach out to me after this happened and text me and ask me if I was there and ask me if I was okay since I go to so many of these gaming events around the country. And I was very grateful that I was able to say, no, I wasn't there. But, you know, for some people that's not the case. Um, and... That's really tragic, and I really, really hope that we get to a point where we can have a common sense conversation about this. And Greg and I spoke about this on Games Daily earlier this week, and I got a lot of responses from you guys about what I said on that show. So I would really love to hear from the three of you about if, if you have any feelings or thoughts or any statements or anything that you would like to say in response to the events that happen and the 
kind of the ripple that has gone through the gaming community? Yeah. Um, it, there's so many layers to, to a tragedy like this that you don't know where to start, really. Um, I mean, gaming has provided a space for me and for many other folks where it has given you a place where you can feel like you're at home and feel safe and feel like you can kind of run to it when you are in trouble or in danger, or you feel like you're in a space where you need to kind of get away from the real world. And it's been uh, one of those things where you see the real world kind of impeding on it in, in these terrible ways where you don't know really how to react and kind of where to push things forward um, in, a, in a good way that feels like things are moving or things are kind of getting better uh, or that you're able to kind of get back the thing that you feel like the, the, the greater gaming community might have lost within a tragedy like this. Uh, I, I guess my, the, the only thing I can say to, to everything else that has happened is that one, you know, you know, our hearts are, are with the folks who were affected. And two, I feel like I, I'm really happy to hear that the, 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 the folks who are running events have been having these conversations in a real way after um, a tragedy like this. Um, it feels like for a long time, especially smaller events um, that are in in smaller venues and you know mom and pop shops and you know in the back of restaurants, you know, in a fighting game community, we see this often. Um, we see this often in a lot of a lot of spaces where you know people haven't been able to afford that security to to, to make that to make that thing. Um, uh, work in a way that has both benefited the events organizers and also the players that are coming to do that to do that work but it feels like folks are now having conversations in even no smaller spaces and that's bubbling itself up and also trickling trickling down to kind of find a, a good spot in the middle where everyone can feel like they can go to an event feel safe and also feel like they're able to enjoy themselves without thinking about all the other stuff that's happening around them um, and I also really hope that this will bolster folks in a way to think about, just how safety is so important at all these events. We all go to stuff on a, on a fairly regular basis. Um, I, I, I chime in with the same thing that you shared, Andy, about, you know, people reached out to me as well and they were like, are you okay? And I was like, I'm reaching out to folks right now as we speak to make sure they're fine. Um, and it's been good to be able to hear people kind of coalesce and kind of get around and talk to each other and, and find out and check in on folks and make sure that they're okay. Cause the community is one that definitely feels like it's grown um, and has become something where I consider a lot of folks in the industry family. So it's nice to be able to feel like those folks are checking in and making sure that everybody else is okay too. So there's a lot of things that, that have to come from a, a, a sad event like this. I feel like the conversations around politics that people don't want to have may have to actually bubble up again in real ways. Um, even if folks don't want to hear it, it's something that needs to kind of push itself forward. Um, and also, you know, the gaming community has to look out for each other in, in, in real ways too. Like we have to make sure that we're paying attention to things that we see. Um, it's the whole see something, say something thing. Uh, you have to make sure that all the folks that you have around you in your circle are like making sure that they're paying attention and making sure that, you know, if you see something that looks a little bit off to be able to talk to people who are running those events and running those spaces and make sure that they know too. So it's a lot of stuff to dig into and we're not going to be able to finish that and fix it in, in this particular show, but it's a lot of stuff that needs to be addressed all at once. Absolutely. And I think it also comes back to the conversation that always seems to happen around one of these gun violence tragedies is the call for more funding in mental health. And the idea that it shouldn't be taboo to talk about mental health. And we've been seeing more and more advertisements uh, kind of relaying this message. We, of course, have, have talked about this message quite a bit. The idea of it's okay to not be okay with our partners over at Take This. And happy to always recommend them as a resource if you're having scary thoughts or depressive thoughts or any kind of thoughts and you just need to talk to somebody about them you don't know who to go to or maybe you don't feel comfortable going to your friends or your family because you don't know how they'll react maybe sometimes it's easier to talk to a stranger and take this.org is a great place for that that they can help you find a professional in your area they also have licensed clinicians that they work with and they can refer you to a variety of resources that can hopefully get you to a better place and to a happier place, a healthier place. And I hope that someday in this country we can get to a place where we collectively agree that it's okay to talk about mental health. It's okay to fund mental health and to allow people 
to take care of themselves from a mental health perspective because we can't keep shaking our heads and asking for thoughts and prayers when this keeps happening. And there's memes and jokes about it, but it's tragedy. It's people turning to humor in times of sorrow because they don't know what else to do. And I would love to be able to say, hey, we don't need to make that joke anymore because we've overcome this. But I don't foresee that happening anytime soon until some real, real change happens. And it's um, it's difficult. And it's tough, like as you said, from a logistics standpoint for these organizers of these tournaments. I know the people who run Evo made a statement as well saying, you know, we're going to reexamine just how much security we have at our event in Las Vegas next year. And I'm sure publishers around the world are having these conversations internally about like how can what can we do to make sure that gaming continues to be a safe place a place where people can come and have camaraderie and share a love of a a common um a shared you know medium and it was really great to hear people like ryan mccaffrey from ign go on national news and talk about how it's not video games that drove this young man to committing this horrible act of violence it was something far darker video games in fact brought those people together because they were all there to celebrate and compete with each other and i'm glad that there's people who are out there championing that because so often when violence and video games are brought up in the same breath together they're immediately linked and I, as fans of the show if you play video games like we do and we hope you do um i think we all are in agreement there that games aren't the cause of this it's clearly something much deeper so um Steimer or Britt did you have anything that you'd like to say or add I feel like you guys are kind of nailing it so <laughs> I'm just gonna sit here and keep nodding and be like yes <laughs> what you are saying plus one and I think Brittany is having a bit of internet camera, issues so camera troubles I have it I have internet issues, so I'm trying not to speak too much because there's a 99% chance I'm going to get cut off. It's happened like 18 times during this conversation, so I'm a little nervous here. Okay, well then on that note, we can probably end this first segment. Thanks for hanging with us. We know it was a long one, um, but we when we come back, we're going to talk about what we've been playing. Finally, Brittany can break her silence on Dragon Quest XI. Plus, we've got much more. Stick with us. We'll be right back. What's good, everybody? Welcome to segment two of the What's Good Games podcast. Brit has restarted all of the things, and now I believe we are technically sound and ready to go for our hands-on segment. Because boy, oh boy, I bet you have a lot to talk about this week after hearing me talk endlessly about Destiny 2 and you being like, I'm just playing Dragon Quest, and I can't say <laughs> anything about it. Uh, now the silence has been broken on Dragon Quest XI. So, Miss Brombacher, how has oh, it been yeah. going? Okay, so I have a lot to say about this, and I'm just going to ramble a lot. So feel free to raise your hand like you do in elementary school if you <laughs> okay. have a question, and I will stop and I will ask you. Um, huge shout out to Square Enix for providing this game as early as they did. I got my review copy around the time we went to RTX, so I've had it for a hot minute, and it has been super duper helpful. I am 70 hours into this. Actually, I'm like 69 hours and 40 hey. minutes at <laughs> night. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I'm at the point in the game where all the characters are starting to say things like, oh, we're at that final chapter. Oh, we better gear up for that big final fight. And so I know I'm near the end. So I feel very confident that I can talk about this game, even though I haven't finished it yet. Also, I'll keep everything spoiler free. So don't don't shit your pants. It's going to be fine. <laughs> so... <laughs> Just don't shit your pants okay, in general. I want to get that embroidered. <laughs> <laughs> don't shit your pants. It's going to be fine. So Dragon Quest XI is the first console Dragon Quest game since, well, I want to say like 2004, Dragon Quest Eight on the PlayStation 2. This game came out last summer in Japan, and now it is coming to the U.S. and North America and all the places very, very soon. So the Dragon Quest XI follows, it's very traditional in the sense that it follows 
a, a young man who was raised humbly in a village. However, he is not of such humble origin. But all the shit went down when he was a baby. So, of course, he doesn't remember anything. He's like, oh, my God, I'm just living in a small village, dealing, living my best life. And then, of course, he finds out he's like this chosen guy. And, you know, if you played any RPGs before, you're going to know exactly kind of where this is sort of kind of going here. So to keep all the spoiler free, this game what I really like about it is that it feels very traditional. It feels very traditional in the sense that you have the silent protagonist. You can waltz into any house you want and raid their cupboards for loot. There are treasure chests scattered throughout the village, typically behind a house. Um, it's where you... I keep my treasure. Yeah, exactly. It's where everyone keeps their treasure outside in the open. Not in trash their home. cans? Yep. Yep. <laughs> not, not in trash cans. <laughs> Um, you, if you're exploring the open world sandboxy areas, if you see a patch of land that's kind of out of place, chances are there's items or something for you there to go look and find. Um, and while I, I appreciate how traditional it is because it feels very much like a Dragon Quest game, um, if you, you know, you have the slimes, all of the charm of the monsters, the little, you know, the cac, the little um, cucumber looking guys that are called cruel cumbers, you know, this, the metal slimes, the regular slimes. I know none of you are, haven't any of you played dragon quest before. Just well, I got to play it at the judges week event that both Steimer and I went to. Um, okay. that's the only time, but Steimer was really just kind of coaching me over, over the shoulder. And we were both getting, um, lessons from miss Kimberly Wallace who oh. put up her gargantuan review on Game Informer this week. So if you guys are looking for our uh, our friend of the show, Kim Wallace's diehard thoughts, as someone who has been in love with the Dragon Quest franchise for many, many years, uh, you can check out her full review there. But Britt, I'm fully aware of what slimes are because I got to be in GI Spy holding a slime, and so did Steimer. That's right. I was there too. That's a good photo. It's a very good photo. So it has all that Dragon Quest charm. And so if you've played a Dragon Quest game, you'll be right home. So it feels very traditional, yet it's beautiful. And the animations are so smooth. that has a, a, a tinge of modernness to it. So if you're like, hey, I love traditional JRPGs and I haven't played one in a long time. Holy crap, this is one of the best ones that's come out in a, in a very, very long time. Or if you're thinking, hey... I have never played one of these, Andrew Renee. I should maybe pick one up and see what the fuss is all about, Andrew Renee, and mm, give it a but shot. She doesn't like turn-based combat. No, she doesn't. But if you just okay, maybe not. Well, that's for what, that's why I was saying, like for Andrea, she should play Nino Kuni too, because I think it would be much more her style of a JRPG. So okay, well I'll hop back to the combat real quick because the combat has a tactic system where you can set how you want your characters to fight. And it's very, very well executed. You can do show no mercy, which means your characters are going to use their most strongest attacks and they adapt to the, to the enemies that they're fighting. So you'll have moves that are effective against slimes or metal slimes or dragons or beasts. And the characters know which moves to use and Wait, they will so heal that unnecessary. Mean? That you so, wouldn't control all of them or exactly. that? Exactly. That means you, you don't would... control them. You can, if you want to, it's the tactic screen. So you can say, show no mercy, unleash all of your best skills. You can do, fight effectively or balance where you do healing buffing and attack so you can do all of those different options and they do work really well and that's how I did 90% of my battles minus the boss fights because each character yes Andrea Renee um question is there a reason why you wouldn't want to do your best attacks up front because it consumes a lot of MP and that's your your magic points and once that runs out you have to have magic waters or you have to find a campsite to get that those points back gotcha but if you're just grinding chances are you have a campsite nearby or there's an inn nearby where you can stay and replenish that as need be the only time when you might not want to use that is when you're fighting a boss and you want to be more tactful in how you're doing things okay so going back so because it is so traditional i feel and you have all your care you have like six characters with you and they all of course have their own interesting backstories and they have their hidden lies that they're not telling you that you have to discover as the story progresses and I think they're all very well done and interesting and I would not mind I would not mind seeing a sequel with all these same characters okay so with that said because it is so traditional there are moments when you can see what's coming a mile away you know that this thing that's going to save the world actually isn't going to save the world and oh boy 
But what I will say is that the game does have some interesting plot twists that I did not see coming. There were a few moments where I would like literally throw my hand in the air and be like, what the hell is that? Not in a bad way necessarily, but uh, you told, okay, you got me off guard with that one, which is hard to do when you've played a lot of JRPGs in your time. Um, I, there, it, it's, it, it's interesting because I feel like some sec- sections of the story are super well done and you can tell they are super thought out and that a lot of care and effort went into them. And then there are other parts where you're wondering, that's weird. Why is that here? That almost doesn't belong. I feel like this was a, oh crap, we have to fit this in somehow. So this is how we're going to do this thing. And there are moments when you have that frustrating time when you are, because you are a silent protagonist that someone thinks you did something. And even though it wasn't you, no one says, Hey, guess what? We didn't do that thing. Let's sit down, have a hot cup of tea and discuss what actually went down. Everyone's like, Oh no, we have to run from you and not actually tell you what happened. You know, that frustrating thing that keeps the story moving. Cause it would probably end the story within, Oh, I don't know, five minutes. If someone could just speak up and be like, listen, actually there's been a big miscommunication and we need to talk about it. I feel <laughs> like that's a lot of like that's games movies in general or... though, right? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. That happens quite a bit. Except, like, um, when it's 80 hours, it's a, big, a bit more ridiculous than a two-hour movie. Yeah, and, and to be <laughs> fair, that is something that I'm super anal about, is I pay attention to those things, because I love story, and I love characters, and I'm like, say this, say that, do that. And so it's something I pick up pick up on relatively easily. Easily, if maybe you're not as crazy as I am about it, you might not even notice it. Um, let's see. So I've talked about the combat a little bit. Is that, that, so the enemies are all on screen. So random encounters are only a thing if you are out traversing via ship, which is something you'll get later in the game. Not a big spoiler. Don't worry about it. Um, oh good, but you, oh what God. about the horsies? And the horsies, you can just mow over enemies with the horsey. Oh. It's very, it's very satisfying. And so I, I appreciate that about it is that you don't have the random encounters, which is nice. So you, and, and actually enemies will run away from you if you're too strong. It, yes, too strong. get out of here. Get out of here. Exactly. You so are that's worth helpful. my time or because you don't even give me any XP. It's not even worth killing you. Like, just go, just get out of here. No, exactly. And that's really nice. That's something in Octopath Traveler that's kind of irritating when you're kind of backtracking and going through some of the lower level areas. It's like, you aren't even worth my time, you plebe or whatever. Uh, so you can essentially fight as much as you want or, or avoid as much as you want, which is really nice. So you fight the creatures, you get your experience points, you have like 12 different statistics that go up every time you level up. But then you also get ability points. So each character has a character development tree or skill tree, and there's different branches. So if you want your character to, to be proficient in great swords, which are super powerful, but you can't have a shield or swords or... Um, knives or whatnot and each character has its own personality tree so if you have a character sylvando who is like a circus clown not circus clown circus he's like a circus entertainer i should say he has a tree that's dedicated to charm because that makes sense because he has to charm people and when you get enough charm enemies will just gawk at you and not attack you so you can especially <laughs> flutter your lashes yeah so very you- nice eyelashes that's very nice eyelashes. So you can customize your character as you want. If you want to be effective, obviously you don't want to put all of your points in a million different spots because you're going to have a weak-ass character and no one wants a weak-ass character. See, that's my problem is that I like to kind of kind of disperse it out until I find mm. my play style. Is it something where kind of maybe like 30 or 40 hours into this 100-hour game, if you decide, hey, I, my play style is actually more in this path and this path, you can kind of respec, or are you kind of locked down once you've decided? So you can totally respec. You just have to find one of the many statues throughout the land and pray to it and be like, hey, yo, dog, can I respec? And she'll if, be like, sure, just give I me some money. That happened in real life. You're like, <laughs> I need to change my personality. Can I just pray to something real quick? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just got to pray and give money and you'll be fine. You can do that, I think, as many times as you want. Um, I had a very easy playthrough. The only issue I had within the first maybe 30 to 40 hours was slight frame rate chugging um, in particular areas. And I don't know if that's because my copy was so early. Um, And what I will say is since then, I haven't noticed it anymore. So I don't know if that's going to be an issue come retail time. Um, And some of the when you equip your characters, specific um, artifacts of clothing will change the appearance of the character. So Ooh, yay. you've probably seen the the blonde the blonde girls in the game, and you can get them these really cute matching green and uh, red polka dotted dresses that they'll wear around during battles and dialogue and whatnot. 
However, there are some cut scenes where I don't know if that just wasn't factored into it. And so in one scene, your character will be wearing something and then the next scene, they're not. Again, not a game breaker, but just like those little attentions to detail that I just kind of pick up on that I thought were kind of annoying. Um, other than all of those things, I think I've touched on most of everything. Uh, let's see. What the, were the boss fights like? Were they interesting? Yes. So the, the the enemies themselves are, I would say, relatively easy. If you just put on show no mercy mode and the tactics, you'll just blow through them super. I mean, granted, I I know where to find some metal slimes, so I was pretty powerful. Uh, but I also enjoy grinding in RPGs, so I was, you know, I'm I'm pretty decent. So the the, the normal enemies. Not a problem, but the bosses are definitely, it kind of reminds me of um, Octopath in that regard that the normal enemies, they're, you know, not super easy, but they're not hard. But the bosses, you have to use all your skills, you have to know when to buff, you have to know when to heal, uh, and they are long fights. For me, they were. Um, and I appreciate that, that they were like, okay, I can't just trust this to the AI, I have to get in there and run the shit myself. And that was nice. So... I would. I, I love this game. I have had a really great time. It's by far my JRPG of the year so far. It's. It. I feel like what this game does is it. It, it feels like game, traditional JRPGs of old, and it's more modern with some of the other things they've done with it, especially with where the technology has gone. They really stuck to the roots, and I would 100% recommend this if you are into JRPGs or if you want to try one for this first time and not deal with some of the technical limitations of games in the past on other eras where you'd have like these super golden games like this. Khalif. I have a question. So I've never played a, drag a Dragon Quest game before ever, ever. Um, do they onboard you pretty well? Because I know that there are a lot of terminologies and there's a lot of uh, fundam fundamental gameplay mechanics that a lot of folks who are familiar with the game already know. Do they kind of lead you into some of that stuff so that you can kind of get up to speed pretty quickly? Yeah, so you don't need to have played any of the other games. Also, sorry if you've been raising your hand for a long time. For some reason, your video isn't showing up in my Skype. I'm not ignoring oh, okay. it, sir. <laughs> uh, so the only other Dragon Quest game I'd ever played was Dragon Quest VIII on PS2 and then a little bit on 3DS. So I'm also like not super-duper familiar with the franchise. If you know how to run a, a turn-based or a JRPG, you're golden. What you're... about the things like the Metal Slimes, like which a lot of people use to level grind quickly? Like, is that a mm -hmm. thing they ever hint at? Or do you just have you to know... know? It's interesting you say that. No, that, I don't think that's ever brought up. I think what you might pick up on if you, again, kind of know what you're looking for, is you will start a fight. And usually those bitches will run within like one or two turns. And you're like, oh, why are they all metal? Why do they run so quickly? They must be worth a lot. And there are special... Uh, abilities you can unlock that are specifically geared toward metal bodied enemies. So kind of putting two and two together, I think you could figure it out. Now that said, you don't have to find and fight those guys because they are very rare. I just, again, I like grinding in RPGs. And so I happily spent a couple hours just kind of going through this cute little like scenic area and randomly finding them. They, you don't see them on screen. You find another enemy and then they'll sometimes just pop in with that enemy when the battle screen begins. Interesting. Awesome. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, I'm really enjoying it. I feel like it takes... Oh, yeah, that's like... There was something like that on Nino Kuni. The weird, like, spaghetti yeah. noodle guys. Yeah, totally. There's always those one-off enemies in every RPG. But this game definitely takes you... And I mean, it will start out a little slow. I will say that. Um, the game really starts picking up once you have more than just one character in your party. Because he is a silent protagonist. And so it's... Kind of like, dude, you're a man of no words. You aren't that very, <laughs> you're, you're not very interesting. But when you get your party and watching them riff and interact between one another, it is really fun. And it's oh, do really they have, like banter when you're walking around or like, do they just mostly comment only in story specific cutscenes? So, and definitely you'll get conversation in cutscenes, story specific cutscenes. But what Dragon Quest has is this party chat feature, party talk or party chat. So, anytime you are anywhere in the world, you open up your menu and you just go to party talk, I think is what it is. And all your characters will be facing you, standing like in a line almost, and they will have something to say about what's going on in that very moment. And it could, it's, and it's something I really appreciate about this game is that the attention to detail is so great. So, you could, Talk to your characters about one thing, and something minor can happen in the story, something that you wouldn't even consider to be that significant, and then talk to them right after that, and they'll all have different lines of dialogue to say. 
if you are in one of the many villages in this game, there are so many villages and towns and locations, and each of them has their own distinct story, and it's all very interesting, and a lot of stuff goes down within these. All, even all the NPCs wandering around will have different things to say depending on what's going on. And I test this out a lot, and I talk to my party members a lot because, you know. And they always <laughs> have something new it reflected to say upon the current situation, which gives them a lot of life and depth. Not depth, but depth. And so I feel like I can always rely on them to tell me, like, like, how do you feel about this? Or what should I do next? And they're really good about that. Neato. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's definitely a long, I think I probably, you know, have at least 20 to 30 more hours to go. If I want to go it's back wild. and do, if I want to go do <laughs> everything, which I what do. I, I, I was reading the Kotaku article, or not article, review. And I remember, like, under dislikes, it was like, the main story is just 80 hours. And I was like, oh, God. Like, I know that there are people who that isn't enough for them. But to me, who in my old age has been like, please make them shorter. Okay. Um, yeah. I was like, oh, dear. That's an only. It's an only 80-hour main story. <laughs> that's crazy. I don't Oof. know why you would complain about this that. This is why I don't play JRPGs. <laughs> this is why you should play Nino Kuni 2. Because I played it for only 40 hours. And some of it, the PS4 was just running without me. So I could fill my coffers. <laughs> um, that was the best song ever. I think, was Something that the remix? Also, or was that yes. the remix? <laughs> Uh, with Dragon Quest, it is kind of, you can just, I know it sounds daunting because it is a very long game. And you're like, why would I just want to play that for one or two hours a night? That'll take me the rest of my life to finish. But it is that kind of game because the story comes in short little spurts where it's like, okay, I will, I have an hour. I'm going to progress the story. And you will progress it enough where you feel like you're getting progress. Someone in a review, um, I was talking to a colleague about this. They've said that it's kind of like the perfect bedtime story where you pick it up, you read a chapter, and you go to bed. But it's kind of like with this game, you pick it up, you play for a couple hours, you will make significant story progress, and you can go to bed and pick it up the next day. Not that How you much will. did you feel like you had to level grind in order to keep up with the story, though? Because like that, I was honestly sl like very, very minorly annoyed with it in Nino Kuni 2, but that's just because at this point I don't really like it. You know, I... I kind of have this like sixth sense when it comes to JRPGs like this, where I just know I'm powerful enough and I don't feel like I did an excessive amount of grinding. Like if you were to ask me about Octopath Traveler, I would tell you I did so much grinding that uh, it was ridiculous. But with this, I feel like it just comes natural and there is so many different areas and there are so many different fun dungeons and you you want to almost fight because you want to see the charm the enemies are so charming and they have such silly punny names that you're like haha what are you going to be called um so it's, it doesn't feel like a chore but you obviously will have to do some but i wouldn't sure. say yeah. an excessive amount by any okay. means well the yeah. fact that you said octopath was already felt like more that makes sense to me yeah cool good times i might try this out i've never played a game like this before so i, I i've played one JRPG and didn't like it. What and one now, was it? Do you remember? I, I don't want to say because people will get mad at me. Oh, whatever. What was it? Final Fantasy VII. <laughs> oh. No, when did, when did you try Final Fantasy VII? Way later. Way after it actually first came out. That's the okay. reason why. I, I, I will definitely yeah. cop to the fact that it was like not during the time that it actually came out. And people were like, yeah. you need to have played it when it first dropped. Otherwise, it may not hold up. So yeah, it was no, for sure. Games. They're they're not wrong. You know, I just played that for the first time a couple of years ago. Um, but again, I love these kind of games, and I grew up with it. So I was able to look back, to s look past the stuff that hasn't really aged well. Yeah. But if you're just like hopping into your first JRPG and you're like, "What the hell is this?" I just moved a pixel. Why am I fighting? I just want to go <laughs> over there. I no, want to like, go to sure. the left. <laughs> try try Dragon Quest Eleven. I feel like if anything, you'll get a sense of what games were like back in the day, but without all the frustrating technical limitations that those games had. Because it does okay. feel that warm and fuzzy charm. I'm like, I'm right at home with it. And that's why I love it so much. I yeah, that. I think just the fact alone that um, there are no random battles, like that makes such a difference when you're just trying to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my God, <laughs> like get out of my way. Yeah. Um, so like cool. I'm interested in this game. Uh, the only reason I'm hesitant on it is because it's it's a large investment. I just finished Nino Kuni. I'm still playing Octopath. 
I feel like I probably have a cap on uh, the amount of JRPGs I can handle in a yes. particular set of time. <laughs> um, but when I was playing it, um, like as Andrea mentioned at that event um, a few months ago, I was like, "This is look, like, this looks beautiful. Like I would love to just run around and explore this world." And the characters we met in the demo, I was like, "They seem cool. Like I would be down to see what their story is." Um, so there was a lot of things where I think I would like this game. I just don't think I can deal with it right now. Well, maybe you could wait until it comes out on Nintendo Switch, and then you can. Do you just think it will? It. Yeah, it's coming on Switch. Oh. It was. Yeah, <gasps> it, it was delayed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, okay. when it does come out, it can be like a little. I will drop thing. Octopath like a hot bag of bricks. That's not. I, saying. It's not coming out day and date <laughs> with <laughs> PS4 or anything like that. It's coming later, but That's it, fine. it is. That's yeah. perfect, actually, because by that time, I'll be like, it's time for me to have a JRPG in my life again. And then it'll be like, here you go. It'll be like, sweet. Yeah, I, again, I totally recommend it. The story is fun. You know, some plot points are super predictable. Some aren't. And there are happy moments where I will laugh out loud. And then there are moments where I will shed several tears. And so it definitely takes you on a roller coaster. But overall, just it's one of those. It's not feel good like Nino Kuni 2, mm -hmm. but it's you're, it's more it has more mature undertones, I'd say. But it definitely takes you, you a mean Friendship ride. won't save everything. But fuck, who would have known? The power of friendship. <laughs> the power Xenoblade of Chronicles friendship. 2 lied to me. Sparkles. But yeah, everything. Definitely great. Everything. Yeah. It's good, good, good. Well, that is very exciting. And I am not going to pr try to pretend like I am going to sink a ton of hours into this game. It's not my role on this podcast. I am the person who is going to be knee deep into Forsaken and the expanded content and the season pass and whatever else is coming for shooters because that's what I do here. But um, there's lots more to, to talk about here. Um, Khalif. You've been playing quite a few things. Um, it was announced last week that NBA Live 19 was going to have a free demo. You've been playing that. You've been playing Dead Cells and Donut County. Where do we begin? Is Donut County or Donut Country? Donut County. Donut ah, that's Donut a typo County. then. Uh, I, was I like, messed that's that up. Weird. That's, my, that's my bad. I messed that Robert. up. Um, uh, let's start off with NBA Live because I think NBA Live has a lot of fun, interesting things that they're trying to do with um, with that next iteration of that game. Um, first of all, it's the first game that you can finally create a, a woman player. Uh, super excited about that. About time. Uh, so I don't know. I'm probably going to ask my wife to, to to jump on the the app and I'll make a version of her so that I can have her run in that WNBA. Don't suck. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah, don't, yeah don't, don't make her proud. Make her yeah, I'm going to be like, hey, she, she's like, I'm super tall and never played basketball. I'm like, yes, you will now. You won't play some ball. <laughs> Video um, games are magic. Yeah, look at you. You're not clumsy anymore. Anyway, she's going to get mad at me when she hears that. But I love you. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I'm super excited for the fact that the game has has finally kind of found its, its, its footing. It, it feels like the first year that it came back last year um, it, after a kind of really interesting hiatus, where they just took off. They're like, we're done. We screwed this up in a way that we can't fix. So we're not going to make another one. Uh, so they came back out last year, got themselves back into the game. And now they are literally a, a, a really uh, formidable competitor and contender uh, for NBA 2K, which I didn't expect them to get there uh, this quickly. I figured they would take a couple of years to kind of get themselves together and then finally be able to kind of take on the champion. Um, but it feels like the game that they've put out so far, with the, at least in the demo, feels like they have gotten all the fundamental things down pretty well. Um, they have their new RPM system, which is a real player movement system, uh, which adds this kind of extra layer of fluidity to the to the to the motions that the the characters will have on the screen. Um, makes it feel more lifelike. It feels like you can get in and out of anim animations in a way that you couldn't do uh, in the game previous. Um, and it also feels like the layers that they're adding to the kind of story modes are, are, are really smart. They're doing um, uh, another jump off of the kind of you're going through the ranks of getting your name uh, into the into two spaces of the the NBA and also kind of the street ball game. Uh, so they're they're jumping on that second layer of that story, which is really cool. Um, but they're really doing interesting and 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 smart things with the way that they're looking at kind of the fantasy version of that game, which is really hard to do because I am a person who does not like fantasy basketball. I think it's a bad idea. 
uh, in general uh, because there are really like six great players in the whole league and you can't really get everyone to have the same players because it's boring. Um, but they figured out a way to kind of add layers to uh, addition, well, adding layers to the card system that they've built where now you're kind of, besides building out big teams, you're building out little, little layers of um, um, uh, decorative things for your court. So uh, you'll open a pack and you'll get maybe a piece of a court or you'll play a, a particular match and you'll get another piece of kit uh, that you'll be able to use to kind of customize a player that you've had in, in the system. R lots of fun stuff that's coming to that game. It didn't have a lot of things you can necessarily do within a demo because it is a demo, but it, it did leave me being really excited for the next version of that game. Um, uh, Donut Country is... Wait, before you, before you move on, I just had a couple yeah. of quick questions. So... Um, obviously there's been a lot of debate in the, um, community around this game and obviously 2K's NBA 2K that NBA 2K is superior and clearly, um, you know, NBA live has their, has their fans, you know, as somebody who's played both of them, why do you think it is that, uh, 2K's version continues to outshine, when you know NBA Live is still hanging on, do you think that there's like fundamental things that NBA Live's not doing good enough that they need to do to catch up? Well, I think that the things that you recognize within those two separate games is that both of them are looking to give you two similar experiences, but they're not the same experiences. That 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 folks who are looking for really hardcore simulation basketball. You're not really going to go to NBA Live for that for that kind of gameplay. It's still not there. Um, it's it feels really good. It, I I kind of compare the two as to like the pick up and go version of basketball is going to always be NBA Live. Like they've gotten a lot of the systems down that will you know add to the player movement to the kind of uh, off the ball movement. It's getting really like super super sportsy, but it's like. Um, the off ball player movement stuff is so important to make a game feel like what you see on TV that if you don't get that stuff down well, you can automatically notice it. You can see it really quickly. It's the thing that even from far away, when we have the graphical fidelity that we have, where you would say, okay, that looks like an NBA uh, broadcast. If things don't move well, you automatically see it. Um, 2K has figured out a way to 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 build upon those small systems and figure out ways to, to, to kind of add everyone into the, into the equation so that you can see player movement, you can see plays being run, you can see the physicality of the players themselves. They have a weight, they have a length, they have the, the kind of uh, uh, small details that, that add up to basketball looking like basketball that, um, that has gone over, over the past couple of years in a way that life hasn't had, a, had, the, had the ability to uh, capitalize on. So I feel like they're getting close. I feel like they're getting there. It's, it's going to take maybe another year or two. It may even take another engine up, up uh, a redo uh, for them to get there. But I feel like they've gotten close um, and that they, they've added enough stuff on the periphery to, to add enough features and enough value to that game where it has become a contender again. So I'm super excited for that because um, I feel like they definitely are nailing some things that 2K has not been able to do. Plus, they had on the other side of that fence a whole bunch of controversy with the fact that their virtual currency stuff wasn't on point. Mm -hmm. um, so so now folks on the on the NBA Live side, they have nothing but upside. 2K at this point is still trying to figure out how to do a little bit of damage control while also getting new people into a game that is kind of inaccessible at this point. If you're a new player to basketball, there are just so many goddamn buttons that you have to try to remember and figure out uh, while why you're still trying to kind of play the game that live has simplified it in a way that also gives you enough control and enough maneuverability uh, that lets you do what you want to do, look cool, and also feel like you're um, comp uh, competing in a way that um, feels like basketball. So I hope that answers that question. No, uh, and above and beyond. That's a great answer. Brit, would yeah. you say as a player of NBA Jam that I would be prepared for NBA 2K19? I think you can. Well, heard live. Those are different games. <laughs> the, the very, the very, the realistic one, 2K, yeah. right? 2K. I think that there are parts of that game that will absolutely appeal to the NBA Live player. <laughs> I mean, to the NBA Jam player. Are there big head modes? That's all I really need to know, Khalif. They need to have a big head mode. That's I don't know. 
I mean, the thing that I really want, that I really, really want, is I want EA Tell me what you want, to come what you really, back. really want. I'll tell wanna you what I want. I want to, I want to, uh, yeah, I really, really, really want to sing a stick. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I want, I want sing a stick uh, to be in the form of EA Big coming back and they make an NBA street game. I think that's something that everybody wants as the in-between thing. But also, mm-hmm. uh, 2K actually, uh, I think, either bought out or acquired the NBA Playgrounds folks. So you, you're you going to have a NBA Jam kind of game from 2K while 2K is also putting out another game. That's hilarious. So That's awesome. Cool. It's it's cool. I feel like everyone at this time has a space that they can figure out the game that they want to play and feel like they're going to be happy about that. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be super cool. Um, Donut Country. Uh, is county. it county or country? County. I keep saying country. County. Uh, I just started playing it the other day, and it has really lifted my spirits. It was like you were, t- you were talking about the kind of heavy week that everybody had. Um, in the gaming community and and getting a chance to play something that is so funny and so smart and it feels like in in a game where you have to press the button to continue to have a conversation i don't see many games feel like they have snappy banter or snappy conversations that 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 are able to be controlled in that way it's not something that you have to just let kind of go across the screen and you can kind of speed it up and, and start the things going. But the conversations that they're having are so funny. I was like, I didn't expect that to be a thing. And yeah, any game I've that been, feels like I've been playing this on iOS and I've been really enjoying my time with it. I mean, I have some other gripes about it that we could talk about yeah. later, but uh, the written dialogue is pretty well done. I mean, and you, you've got like a, a raccoon. Hanging out. He Who doesn't is, love a raccoon? Trash raccoon. panda. He is the dopest raccoon I've seen <laughs> in a in a very long time. Like I was like, I might I love you, but also want to punch the hell out of you. It's like such a good character that was was written. I ben just Esposito. downloaded this game, or I'm downloading this game right now. <laughs> yeah, shout out shout out to Ben Esposito and, and the rest of that crew for putting together. And 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 Annapurna, they continue to put out and publish such dope games. Like they they don't miss. Uh, and they haven't had a, a miss in a long time, so I'm happy to see that that's a thing. I do have a tiny pushed. bone to pick, a tiny yeah. bone to What's pick your about, tiny bone? about this tiny Anna, bone. About, with Annapurna in particular. So uh, yeah. Ben um, Esposito, the developer of this game, was on the show with Greg on Games Daily uh, earlier in the week, and I'm glad that he was there to kind of give some context as to why this game took over five years to make, almost six years to make. Because yeah. I was like, holy donuts, that's a long time. Yes, because I was like, why on earth am I seeing this game? I've seen this game at like four GDCs. It's like unreal how many times the the public, uh, the public publisher has reached out to me with their PR people to be like, do you want to come see Donut County? And I'm like, nah, dog, I've seen that game. <laughs> when are you going to actually publish that game? And like hearing him talk about how he was – what I have to imagine is not even part time, but just like part part time working yeah. on this game as he was working on other projects makes sense because game dev is hard. But like hearing him talk about how he got tired of seeing it. And so he had to work on other projects creatively to keep involved. I got I'm like I'm torn because part of me is like I've always been looking forward to this game from the first time I played it. Back in its early stages years ago, I was like, I'm sold. You don't have to show me another thing. I don't need to see another trailer. I don't need to play it in another build. Just just release it. I'm I'm done. And then when I found out upon its launch this week how short it is, around Mm. two hours of gameplay, I was instantly kind of mad. And I hate that because Ben is such a nice guy and the game is really fun. And the puzzle mechanics are well done. The art is great. But, like, there, there's this inexplicable thing inside me that's just angry that it took so long for this game to come out that I want to ask. I need to, I need to have an answer from either Ben or from Annapurna to be like, why did you guys show this game so many times? Why didn't you just pay him more to get it done and to ship it and get it out the door? You know, they weren't yeah. coming or to us asking really to, play to take a break three stop times. showing it in three years when it's a 45 minute game you know like i just ah i'm so conflicted but like <laughs> i don't want that to affect how i how i feel about the game but it, it does and i hate that <sighs> oh uh, we so lost. wow so it's only two hours and it took five years ish to make 
Yeah, wow. but that's not five years of straight working on it. Well, yeah. no. No, no, I'm not saying I get it. Like, game dev is hard, but yeah, it just seems like a peculiar case. Yeah, I mean, but I don't even, know, maybe... even him talking on the show on Games Daily about how once Annapurna came on board and helped fund the rest of the development and he was working on it full time for the last year and a half, I'm still like, what? <laughs> Wait, what? A year and a half? I, I think the reason I'm upset is because I, I wanted more. Because it's yeah. that it's that it's that well done, and the job that he did with it is it's super approachable, and it's very intuitive, and the graphic style is 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 fun and a little whimsical, and the writing is humorous, and there's a lot of good things I can say about this <laughs> game. I just I think Stickly. I'm mad artificially, and then don't and don't don't at me. And come back to me with your comments and be like, Andrew, you're just being mad for the sake of being mad. And I'm not, I'm not. I'm just saying I think part of me is just a little, like, perturbed because I wanted more from this game. And I only got, like, a, a tiny little bit. And now I'm like, dog, don't tell me it's going to take another, like, three to five years for you to do more Donut County. <laughs> like, what? Here's what I'm going to say. I appreciate the fact that you are left wanting more because I feel like the alternative to that is that it outstays its welcome. And then you're just sitting there like, why is this game, what this should have been edited better. So I would say it's a testament to the editing of said game that it is such a nice, short, beautiful experience. Look at you pulling a Brit. Hell yeah, yeah. girl. <laughs> yeah. I, well, it's just funny because I, I say this all a lot at work. And I'm like, yes, that, but make it shorter. Like, I want everything to be shorter because I just think that it's more, it, it's, it becomes a better product when you do, like, cut down the fat. So, okay, Brett. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm playing it, like, going through it now, I'm, I don't know if I want, like, because I'm not at the end of it, but I don't know if I want this experience to be even longer than the runtime that you said. Because I feel like it, it shows its cards pretty early and the mechanics are fairly easy to, to understand and the puzzles aren't that intricate. But it feels like the thing that's holding that together is that snappy banter parts that are that are pushing you along the story. And if they were to keep adding people, I'm going to be like, I don't care. Get be done already. Mm. So it's so I, so I get that part, too. I, I, it is it is good where you can see a really cohesive uh, thought come to fruition and like come into game form and you're like damn it if you could just put like a little bit extra in there it would be dope but I don't I don't want a lot of that game I want it now, to be kind of short well, and, and, and done now do you think it's the puzzle mechanics itself that would get old or do you think it's the, the banter right because those are two total different things well I think it, it shows itself again like mm -hmm. pretty quick so it's like you basically have two phases of of every round and it's basically like figure out what the puzzle is and then eat everything like Katamari Damacy. And it's like, once you've done that part, then there isn't anything else to do. You know, so it's like you do that one particular thing and then you're like, all right, so now I've, I so have to eat everything and go away. It's not like solitaire where it's like the same thing over and over and over again and it never gets old. Yeah, yeah, nah. It, 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 like you, can tell, you can tell that if you added a little bit extra to it, that it would definitely overstay its welcome. And I'm, I'm, mm. I'm okay with it. Something that I have to bring up because the frugalist in me needs to is the price. So I yeah. bought it today on iOS. They didn't provide me a code. I bought it. I just bought it for right four ninety nine, yep. which seems like a semi reasonable price for a two hour game, even though there are many, many more games available in that same price range, if not less that provide more hours of gameplay. The problem I have is its price on PlayStation 4, which is twelve ninety nine in the PlayStation Ooh. Store. Ooh. So, mm. so I'm like, I don't understand why there's such a difference in price between mm. what's available on iOS and what's available on PlayStation. So I'm trying to look it up and, and figure out, does the PlayStation version have additional levels? Is there something else? Otherwise, like, I can't, I can't fathomably recommend anybody play this on their PlayStation. Because why no. would you pay like double the price, more than double the price, for the same game just to have it on your console? And like, yeah, that sounds yeah. weird. I just I don't understand what's happening there. Does anybody else have any insight into this, or are we all kind of in the dark? No, that's bizarre. I also did a quick Google search, but to no avail. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a code provided by Annapurna, so I can't say shit. 
I think. I well, I mean, I mean, I think. It, I think it's. I think it's. I think that's too much, though. Twelve bucks. Yeah, is way twelve too much. is a lot. Bucks is too much. Well, hmm. especially it's weird when it's so. It's the same. Anyways, you I think it would be. Thing? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm you just... just made a grunt, so I wasn't sure if that was a ha ha grunt. No, it, was a so, it was a socially uh, in tune agreement with something Khalif said that I couldn't tell you what it was. Oh, it. And now that I hear the, the the story behind it, I'm like, damn it! For that extra amount of money, you better be tortured. <laughs> it would have been some torture development going on. Torture development. <laughs> no, oh, no. I mean, what what can you do about that, right? It's like I don't know how that works in terms of the App Store versus PSN, and if they make you mark it up or if they, you know, was it on? I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Well, someone uh, knows. Yeah, I just, it's just like not any of us. I, yeah, I think that my complaint here is something that's echoed in the this GameSpot review from from James O'Connor. Um, which he says in the last, the, kind of like in the last paragraph of his review, that um, Donut County is a game with fun ideas and a pleasantly relaxed attitude, but it's not the most compelling of experiences. It's easy to control, clever, amusing, and I finished it across a single session without growing bored, but it doesn't offer the catharsis you might expect from a game about wanton destruction and its lightness and short run time. Make it feel inconsequential. Once it's done, you're likely, you're unlikely to think about it much again, let alone play it through a second time. Like a donut, it's sweet and satisfying, but you're acutely aware that there's a hole in the middle of it. Oh, wow. Oh, come on with your that's, donut that's... metaphors. Mm. No, I mean, like, here, here's what I'll say, is that, yeah, <laughs> much like a donut, it tastes really fucking good Can we not talk in about the first couple so of hungry. bites, and then it's instantly done. And then you're like, well, that was, that was... Go now it's gone. That was delicious. Uh, now I need have another one. That hips? was way that too short. The satisfaction was too quick. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I won't hold it with Uh No, what you need to do is to, to fix this problem. Thank you, Andrea. Is you need to go to the Simpsons world or whatever the hell it's called in Universal Studios and get one of the pink donuts from, is it Donut Doughboy? Doughboy Donuts? The, oh, the, yeah, I, the I Homer know. Giant Donut. Oh, God. That takes at least like 18 and a half big bites. So oh. good. Amazing. It also takes about 18 and a half years off your life. That's fine. It's worth it. That's all. I, I, I worth can it. do that now. Uh, and I last want thing, donuts I think, now. Oh, I really want donuts too. Um, I'm not supposed <laughs> to have any right now. Um, I've been Forever. banned. Um, Dead, Cells, Dead Cells has been ridiculously cool. Uh, I have I've not dug into a game like this in a very long time where it is my now go-to-bed game. Uh, which is not a thing that you would think of for a roguelike. No. Where you think that would just be a whole bunch of frustration. But it's like, at this point now, for, it was like uh, Paragon was my, my go-to-bed game, then it was <laughs> Fortnite. I know, I know. We're going <laughs> to hug each other and cry when we see each other. Um, sorry, not to interrupt. It's called Lard Lad Donuts. Don't at me. Don't get mad at me. I know I called it Doughboy, and I was very, very wrong. I know there's some... Anyway, continue. Don't sorry. at Brit because of that. Uh, but now it is definitely my go to bed game. It's like hmm. if you get a good run in, find some good weapons, find some good loot. And then you're like, you can go into it and say, I want to accomplish this particular thing tonight. And you will either get it or you will not get it. And you will just either be really frustrated or really excited. <laughs> and that's nice. Like, I like the fact that I have a really short amount of time before I have to go to bed to like knock out a thing. Um, and I've learned enough things while uh, through each uh, playthrough that I now have the ability to kind of see things coming that I did not see before and be able to kind of react to it, kind of plan for it and strategize how I want to take on a level um, so that I can get the most kind of bang for my buck during the gameplay sessions that I have. And I really love that. I think that that's super cool. And I finally played it on PC the other day on stream and they have Twitch integration in it, which is evil. It's <laughs> so evil. It's dope, but it's so evil. <laughs> Because you can just it has a bot that gets thrown into the chat, and they can basically uh, do do uh, cool things for you or like screw your whole game up. People um, are mean. People were super nice though. I was. Oh, were they? Yeah, people were super nice. They were like, "We're gonna give you health, Khalif," and I was like, "Thank you." Oh, nice you got a big. nice people watching you. And then they were like, "Every time you move forward, no, what was it like? Uh, every time you get." through a door or something like that, you get poisoned. And I was like, that's fucked up. That was me and evil. <laughs> there's like, there's like a thing where like your health just magically just drains the longer that you're, you're in, you're poisoned throughout a level. And I was like, I'm no, never going to get past you. this. I'm literally never going to get past this level. Thank you. Thank you, chat. Um, but I'm Thanks hoping that for that's nothing, Hogwarts. Hogwarts. 
Uh, well, we do have a Dear WGG about this. Um, oh. Charles writes in and says, something I was just hoping you would pass along. I was watching gameplay of Dead Cells today, and they show that in the options, you can change the kind of food that shows up in the game. One of the options no. is even vegetarian. As a vegetarian, this <laughs> makes me very happy, but it is a feature I fear many might not realize. Could you give a shout out to all the vegetarians out there about this? Given the super high review scores it's getting, I'm sure I won't be the only one playing this game, and this is the first time I've ever heard of this option. I appreciate that. I need to turn that on to see what the actual options are when you throw it into vegetarian mode. I think that that's super yeah. cool. Like, does everything Here's just a turn vegetable. into broccoli? Well, I don't no, know. I mean, there's more than that, but yeah, that's neat. What? And I was saying no because I'm like, please stop talking about food. I'm so hungry. <laughs> I'm I know. So hungry. I know. <laughs> I'm living on water right now, but it's but it's it's super it's super fun. It is taking up all my time at this point, and I think about it when I I have it on four different platforms. Or three at wow. least. I have it on I have it on Switch, I have it on PS4, and I have it on PC. Nice. So yeah, I'm I'm spending lots of What's money at this one. PC because of the Twitch integration stuff. No. Um I wish that they would push that into console. Because <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> Almost like torture, that. sir. I was interested in Dead Cells, but I don't like losing progress. So I kind of steered clear from all that shenanigans. You get to keep you get to keep some of your progress. Like, you don't get uh, to keep it from round to round, mm -hmm. but you bank your cells by getting new equipment that you've gained throughout the levels, and those things will be available to you in your next run. So that's that's a good way to to to, to think about if you want to jump into that game because you will get stuff that you can keep. Okay, that's good to know because yeah. I I've tried the rogues and uh, uh -huh. I can't do it can't do yeah. it i get too frustrated i want to make progress with life and not keep being sent back <laughs> literally if roguelike or roguelite is in the name i'm like deuces <laughs> oh no i like these kind of games i'm thinking about getting this for switch actually yeah um because i like i like i want to carry with me <laughs> it is a great pick up and go on a portable console game it's definitely great for that do you play it in handheld mode because is yep. it fine control wise yeah, totally. Cool. There's a there's a little bit of um uh, uh frame rate stuff on that game, but it, you don't notice it that much until you play it on console or PC. Mm -hmm. Sure, but uh, I won't do that, so it'll be okay. Yeah, you'll be you'll be fine. So Steimer, yeah, you've been playing some stuff. Oh, I finally finished a game. What Congratulations, up? you did the thing. But I feel like it's been a while, but I'm not actually sure if it has. Um, yeah, I finished Nino Kuni too. I spent, like I think I already mentioned earlier, I spent about 40 hours, a little bit less than that because that's what the game clock says, and I definitely left this sucker alone at some points to just accrue money because I needed my coppers. Uh, I needed the coppers to be full so I could upgrade my kingdom. Um, that was like the only thing that so sort of annoyed me. I know why they did it, but it, there are definitely gates at certain points with either skirmishes, which are, as we've mentioned before on prior podcasts, like where you're out in the world and you are like little chibi characters and you have four units um, that's sort of like a rock, paper, scissors battle happening. Uh, so they have those which are gated. So I had to level grind my troops there because they were really low and the only way to level them up essentially is to just throw battles. Like, and what I mean by that is you just go into battles that are way above your level and just lose a bunch of times in a row. And then you're, you get a bunch of XP that stays with you. And so then your troops level up. Uh, but it's not like a particularly fun thing to do to be like, great, I'm going to spend like 30 minutes just losing this battle over and over again. Um, were you recruiting when, other members that were strong? That strong like both? I, yeah, I did I did eventually like sort of expand my troops out, but honestly, I didn't touch the skirmishes until the game made me. Mm. I'm not the person who's doing like optional ones whenever a citizen like somebody you could recruit to your kingdom had to do a skirmish. I was like, nah, I'm okay. Uh I have enough people living here. <laughs> I'm good, man. I don't need you. Uh although if you want to like level up and have a really massive, beautiful kingdom, you will need to do those things. And that's totally fine. If you like want to just super dive into this game, you can. I felt like I had a nice balance. I did I did side quests. I think I did 50 side quests because I got the trophy. Um, and like so I got a little bit more than that, but I didn't go down the rabbit hole of everything by any means. There was tons left to do 
when I left the game, I did like two dreamer mazes, which are these, um, long dungeons that are sort of random. And also once you, like, if you, there's a danger level happening on the (laughs) side of the screen and it just constantly is ticking. So like as you're going through it, the longer you stay in the dungeon, the more powerful the monsters become. And then you can pray to like these statues because apparently, as we've mentioned, this is a JRPG trope. Um, <laughs> and then it will bring the danger level back down so you can continue forward without getting your ass totally kicked. Um, I thought those were actually pretty cool. They were interesting places. I did feel stressed, very stressed when I was in them and like, wanted to explore because I wanted to get all the items, but then was also like, shit, shit, shit. I got to get out of here. I'm going to die. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So just for some context here, I put about 80 hours into Nino Kuni 2 and I did all the things Timer's talking about. So one of the things I did was I expanded my kingdom to the max and then I made it. So the danger thing just completely, I don't know if it completely stopped, but it moved like molasses. Cause uh, I was like, it also caused me problems. I'm like, this is too stressful. Cause you never know. Yeah. That's a neat, yeah, the kingdom building is cool if you, like, want to sit and invest that time, um, because as Britt just mentioned, like, it'll give you interesting perks, like, throughout the world. You can sort of, you can level up the different spells you're using, you can level up, uh, not level up, but, like, you can, like, reduce costs on, like, the weapons you're using. I upgraded my weapons, I upgraded all my higglies, which are so cute, um, so, like, yeah, there's a, there's definitely a lot of depth to this game if you want it. And then there's – but it also does sort of give you the option to kind of leave it alone. Um, there are certain points, like I mentioned, where it you you have to. You have to in- involve yourself in the skirmishes at some point. You have to level your kingdom up to three. It's just you have to if you want to beat this game. Um, and pro tip, you need to level up your weapons trap to four. Um, otherwise, you can kind of – do as you wish, but those are the things you need in order to progress on the story. But, uh, I really, really enjoyed the game. I have a, a slew of text messages to Brit that I sort of live tweeted my, my takes as I was playing. Um, just cause like the, some of the story stuff, I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it was a really cute game. I'm really glad I played it. It was a nice reintroduction to JRPGs. I'll say, because it is, Action oh combat, God, so you're not oh feeling God, like, oh, man, I've got to, like, think about this super hard. Um, and then you have, like, there's no random encounters. Like, there's basically, like, all of the real icky pain points of JRPGs. It doesn't have those, but it does have all of the charm and a lot of interesting, like, world building um, and characters. So Yay. I still think Andrea should play this game because, again, you can play as, like, a half-cat boy. And what could be better... <laughs> Than that, I think she should Your play dad it too. Is a cat. Come on. But listen, with Destiny coming out, with, it's just well, never, it's never gonna happen. Well, I do have say... three long, technically six with the round trip, international flights over the next two months. So I'm gonna need something to play oh, on my God, Switch. Yes, I do have a couple games. In my it's in my plan to play Celeste, but. Um, I can also put Nino Kuni 2 on there and, and check it no, out. You can't, you can't, baby girl. Not and see Switch. how it goes, but it's not on Switch. Wait, Nino Kuni 2 isn't on Switch? No, it's, it's a only PS4, on PS4 and PC. Guess yeah. I'm not playing it ever. You can Octopath. play Octopath. <laughs> <laughs> got those things you don't like. Octopath. <laughs> Do you see, <laughs> sir? This is yeah. gonna send you. You're gonna send you dead cells and all the games that you don't like. No, I hate roguelikes. It's gonna be hard <laughs> enough for me to play Celeste. <laughs> oh. Yeah, when you said Celeste, I was like, "What? You're gonna play that game?" I've what? never played I it. And I said that before we get hours. to Game of the Year considerations, and we're freaking rapidly approaching the end of the year. It's almost September already. Oh, yeah. uh, that I have to play that game because everybody gave it all these crazy scores at the beginning of the year, and so I have to I play just it. Put it on BBS Baby Mode. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm definitely going to use assist mode whenever I can. You can judge me if you want. Whatever. Go ahead. I don't care. Um, it was it, just so stressful. I got to the point where, like, you're being chased by essentially your shadow or something. I don't know what you're being chased. You're being chased. And I was like, I can barely do this kind of platforming when I'm not being chased by something. <laughs> now that you've introduced this, I'm having so much anxiety. I don't know what to do with myself. Well, so, yes, I need to go back and try it again, but with modifiers because I didn't put any on. Yeah. 
so that's my so that's my plan but um I'm not going to talk too much about what I've been playing because I've been playing the same. It's just more Legend of Soulguard and more Destiny 2. I do want to briefly touch on the new trailer that came out today um, for Cade 6 and the Forsaken. Because I am so deep into Destiny 2 right now with the uh, with the What's Good Guardians. Uh, I finally did the Eater of Worlds raid lair um, and I'd never done that and it was really fun and really complicated, but we did it and I'm really looking forward to everything that's coming. It's still kind of not real to me that they're killing Kate six. I, I, I still like part of me is holding out hope despite the fact that Deej talked to us in person and was like, yeah, dog, he's dead. And I'm like, no, nah, and Nathan not. Fillion's not even doing his voice. I know. I just like. I don't want like it to Like you're killing true. him in such an unsatisfactory way. <laughs> At least have Nathan Fillion come back. <sighs> it wasn't there already an update push where Cade's gone from the tower now? He he was sent off to go like investigate something so you can't so even find him anymore. They pushed an update live this week. Yes, and that there are uh, in a ahead of Forsaken. I haven't logged in. So we're recording on Tuesday of this week because we're flying up to Brits for uh to shoot the Happy hour Q and A in the secret segment for you guys, um, but I haven't logged in yet. I might log in tonight if I get my packing done in time. Uh, but I'm just I'm so pumped. I'm really kind of devastated that I'm going to be out of the country. So I think I'm going to bring my console with mm -hmm. to my family trip oh in Copenhagen. Oh my god! Wait, <laughs> but don't you? Well, well don't there you goes need all a power adapter. Like that's not gonna. Um, I have a power adapter, so because okay. both John and I travel quite a bit, and he travels much more internationally than I do, we have a power adapter. Um, but I think I love that you guys have a. I know it's it's dumb <laughs> for your PlayStation. But so we're. See, um... you can play Nino Kuni. <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say there goes all those Switch games she was gonna play. Let no. me guess on the flights she could, unless she wants to get real no, hardcore. No, so here's the thing: we've tried. You cannot play a PlayStation in flight. The power draw is too much, mm. even with the adapter. But you can play it like when you're like in a hotel and you're power drawing from like a building. But in flight, it's not enough power to to, to turn on the, the console. Trust me, we've <laughs> tried. I just we tried. that you're like, we tried. Because like that's not a thing I would ever try to do. I would just be like, I yeah, that doesn't so... work. So mad at you if I'm the person sitting next to you, too. I know. You're, like, breaking out this PlayStation. You got, like, the game screen that you have. You're yeah. Like, what Elbows are you off doing? Like yeah, but here's the thing. A lot of times, you know, because John has status, he'll get upgraded or he'll be able to, you know, get into, like, an aisle seat or an exit row or something because he flies so much. I mean, he used to be the king of the skies. I'm sure there's people listening to this podcast that remember the days of the John Drake tracker. That was a thing. And so um, he flies a lot. And so because of that, you know, he usually gets a seat that has a little bit more room. So, of course, we tried to bring the console and play the console on the plane. But no, it didn't work out. No lesson learned, but that doesn't mean we can't bring it with and play it in the hotel. Um, I just like, I know that Spider-Man code is coming and there's clearly a lot of people that have reached out to us to ask us, do you have Spider-Man code? Have you been playing it? And no, we don't have it. Hopefully by the time the podcast airs, we will get it. Um, hashtag game provided by PlayStation. Um, but we don't, <laughs> we don't know yet. It, it's very possible that we might just have to wait until you guys get it and then we all played at the same time and then we're all powering through it the weekend after it launches and then we can all talk about it the weekend after um something we should consider and no need to answer this right now everybody but maybe we contemplate doing a spider-man spoiler cast at some point could be fun mm -hmm, mm -hmm, could be mm -hmm. interesting um but um yeah i'm looking forward to playing that game don't have it yet but hopefully we'll be getting a copy soon fingers crossed don't know if so, ladies and gentlemen, there's going to be a very, very special Brit and Steimer show next week. So our dear Andrea is going to be traveling like she was just saying. And if we have our code, we can talk about it next week. It's true. Oh, brave. Come it's on, true. Oh. Look, look a little excited. Got to pump I up am the audience. excited. I'm just so tired. Yay! <laughs> All right. There we go. On that, on that note, we're going to take one more short break and come back for the last segment. Don't worry. It won't be an hour long. Stick with us, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everybody. It's the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And as you have been listening to all show special guests, with Cody Adams is here. Last time he was here, we talked about the Spawn on Me podcast and the amazing work that you guys are doing spotlighting not only the creators that are on Spawn on Me, but other creators of color who work in the gaming community and how that's such an underrepresented voice. And I am so excited that you guys have had so much success. We talked about it in the first segment that you guys are celebrating 250 episodes which is Damn. like Woo. gotta give you like props for that that is crazy we're just on episode 68 i can't imagine where we're gonna be <laughs> when we get to episode 250 so huge congratulations to you when you first started spawn on me did you envision that you would reach this point was a part of you that was like i'm gonna keep this going until the end or were you like I don't know what the fuck is going to happen. <laughs> it was literally the latter. I don't know what the fuck is going to happen. <laughs> it, it is it is not a thing that I thought would go this long. It was interesting because uh, my co-host Sharif and I, we did a show prior to Spawn on Me that was called Character Select, and it was only on Google, Google uh, Hangouts. And it was like a not really put together show. It was like 17 people in a room just talking about random game stuff. And then having this be you know, something that's been pushing forward for so long. It was really interesting to go back this week and listen to like episode one and two and just be like, you sucked. You were <laughs> hey, so we all start bad. Yep. You were booty butt cheeks bad. You were terrible. My booty favorite what Khalif booty saying, butt booty bad. butt cheeks. Booty butt cheeks. You don't know booty butt cheeks? Oh. Oh, that is, that is, that is a car. Ka, uh, one off TM beat booty butt cheeks. That one. So booty uh, butt cheeks is a bad thing. Booty butt cheeks is a bad thing. It depends if you have great booty butt cheeks, then it's not. But if you are booty butt cheeks, then it is. Imagine Wait, what's between what? the booty butt cheeks. Oh. 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 Mm. I'm like I like booties and I like butt cheeks, butt cheeks, but not what's between. Okay, I understand. Exactly. I got you. Exactly. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. Read, read between between the raisins on that one. Um, <laughs> But <laughs> I see what you did there, sir. No, we're not going to let that fly. You and your oatmeal raisin shenaniganry propaganda. Yeah. Go ahead. Wait, um, wait, wait. While you have the segue here, I have to read this that came out earlier in the show notes, and we completely glossed over it. <laughs> Somebody wrote in to Dear WGG specifically for Khalif and says, wait, 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 it's where from, is I, it? I have it. I have it. It's from Tyler McCall. <laughs> okay. What is it about oatmeal raisin? First of all, Tyler McCall had an actual legit question, but we're skipping that and getting to the good stuff. What is it about oatmeal raisin cookies that make them the best cookie choice? Is it the delicious brown sugar, the fruity raisins? Mmm. Dot, 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 it, dot, is, dot. it is literally because it is healthy and tasty at the healthy same time. Healthy healthy. Absolutely. Oats? It, well, look, for all the folks who are, uh, you know, a little bit older in age, at some point, fiber is going to have to you be a thing your in your fiber. life. You don't need fiber in a cookie. Why not? If you want to be mean, healthy, sir, it's you, nice get your, to have. you get yourself a tub of oats and some grapes, and then you can have the healthy parts of the oatmeal raisin cookies right there. I'm Ooh, saying, I would eat a tub of grapes. I love grapes. Scientifically yeah. proven that oatmeal raisin cookies are good for your heart and for your fiber. Yes, it's true. That um, would depend on how you make them. <laughs> can you I add like, a bunch of I, butter? A bunch of sugar. No, it ain't seven, healthy. Seven out of ten doctors say. <laughs> seven out of ten. Oh, it's always those three pesky ones that aren't seven, quite sure about oh, anything. The, the, well, those three, you know, they, we don't know where they got their license. Uh, I don't want to get There's on seven, another cookie yeah, tangent. True. Let's go. I no do. Let's tangent. talk about cookies. No, I'm just kidding. Let's talk. I'm not kidding. I'm but, but, it, but it is one of those things, like, when you go back and listen to some of the older shows and you're just like, who would have ever thought that at this point I would be talking to you all? That I'd be, you know, that we as a show would be, you know, having done some of the cool things we've been able to do, talk to, you know, Aaron Greenberg and be in the New York Times and, you know, all these other really cool things I, that I've personally been able to do as well. You know, get to host a whole bunch of cool things and be in spaces with people who I who I look up to and, and, and admired in the industry. And it's been a really chilled out ride. Like I was telling folks earlier uh, today, I was like. I don't know. I may totally cry during our during our panel because it is like a very difficult thing to start something. And as a person who has not really had a lot of wins in, in this young life, like 
you know, people don't know that, and this is, I don't want this to get too heavy, but like people don't know, you know, I'm the child of like two drug addicted parents, you know, like grew up in the Bronx during the eighties, during the crack era. Like I shouldn't be here in a lot of ways. Like I shouldn't be on this planet, you know, uh, lots of things have gone well. Lots of things I've been lucky to have. Lots of good people in my life who have pushed me into different directions that kept me out of, you know, negative spaces. And to be able to have my co-hosts rock with me, all of us kind of figure out a vision for what we wanted this show to be. And to to see some of that stuff, see some of those goals kind of come to fruition is really like a, a thing that I sit back and I have a lot of, um, I'm really thankful for. Um, it having a lot of the um, push and, and giving me a lot of, of drive to do, to do this thing and to do other stuff. I wasn't motivated in the same ways that I was before. Uh, so it's really awesome to be able to say that we have people in our community who love what we do, uh, who think that we're doing something important, uh, who continue to support us both with their time, their effort, and their money. Um, and to be able to see us get to this this early milestone, I say it's early because I know folks who are like doing show 700 or whatever, um, that it feels great to be able to say like, Hey, I, I have made whatever the stamp on this planet has been, uh, and people rock with it. So, you know, thank you to, to all of you for, of course, having me on, but it's also one of those things like everybody in Bercago, you know, I deeply love you all. And it's like something seriously that I take, uh, to heart that when people are like, you do good work, you know, we appreciate that you do this show. Uh, and that you've continued to push forward and and make good stuff when people don't want to hear necessarily the message that we necessarily put out every week. Uh, but there are a lot of folks who do rock with it and do really appreciate what we do. So that makes a that means a lot. Ka, my oh, only yeah. gripe with with uh, with your show. Yeah, I have to bring it. Sure. Sharif says Jif, yeah. and it, I know it, I I I don't know what to do about it. Every time he brings it up, I'm like, <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Yeah, I, I, I have the, like, parent glare through the Discord. <laughs> and I'm just like, you you said, you, you said, you said, you said I love how you just gloss over it. And you're you like, yeah, be like, giffy this and oh, giff this. Oh, that's peanut butter would be around. I, I, see, here's the thing is Reef, Reef is smarter than me. So I don't want to, I don't want to mess with Reef. I let Reef rock and do whatever he needs to do. He loves science. He knows trigonometry. He knows all that. So he, he teaches kids. He like teaches them how to do math. I don't want to get mad at I don't want to get mad at him. He's doing good things in the world. Like I'm just being a smart ass and, and, and trying to be snarky and, and wink at people on the on the internet. <laughs> it's, not, it's like, you know, I, I just want him to, to do what he needs to do so he can continue to do the wonderful work that he actually does. And and Cicero too, like Cicero says words. I'm just like, you you just really just went to the thesaurus before you got on the show and you was really excited, right? <laughs> So you, so you wanted to find a synonym for a word that you could just easily pull out of your ass, and you just wanted to use the really big word, big version of that, didn't you? Okay, I love so that. we all have our, we all have our, we like, all have our. I quirks. hope not sporadically. Right? Like that, was, <laughs> that guy is so analphabetic. I was like, that's okay. You oh, oh, just, oh, okay. <laughs> you could just said the person couldn't read, and when you were talking about me, that's fine. That's okay. But yeah, it's 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 been a good run. Uh, it's not over yet. We're continuing to kind of push forward and um, trying to figure out new ways that we can kind of get good content in front of people, get to talk to the folks that we still haven't gotten on our list, uh, that that's on our list that we haven't been able to talk to, I should say. Um, and trying to, you know, I still have dreams of what our show could be. Uh, and I don't think we're I don't think we're there yet. So I'm still trying to figure out what those next steps might be and how we can really grow this into something that we can actually affect the way that people look at people of color, the work that we do and the kind of voice that we have in the space in a real way. Um, so, you know, hopefully folks will be able to, to, to rock with us and help us get there and then we'll continue to move forward. So let's talk about this awesome initiative that mm. you are working on. So you approached us and sadly, because of the timing of it um, and us going to uh, be out of the country. We won't be able to participate in the stream itself, but we're hopefully going to be able to spotlight what you guys are doing and support you in other ways. But you guys are doing this awesome Spawn for Good event that's happening in September. Yeah, so late September, uh, a buddy of mine, Sterling McGarvey, he's uh, deep into the uh, 
gaming industry. He was there during the G4 period. He worked for GameSpy. Um, he's like integral and you know, the reason why I'm even in the, in the industry now, he like held my hand and like took me around. Was like, how he knows things. Yeah. Sterling's great. I've known him for a really long time. Yeah. Sterling is one of the best people on the planet. Um, and we were, we were talking about doing something together and we wind up over dinner one night having a conversation about the midterm elections. And we were like, Hey, I've been trying to figure out ways to do a voting registration drive. He was like, I have two. And I said, well, we have this platform for, with Spawn for Good where, you know, we look at um, things that need to be discussed or, or topics or, or, or initiatives that need to be uh, addressed in the greater gaming community and in society. And we should maybe do this thing together. Um, so he had a, an idea of working with this fantastic organization called Vote Writers, who um, their main purpose is to basically get people the IDs that they need to get to the polls. So there's a huge conversation within the gaming industry. I'm sure that you have heard this about people not wanting to mix their games and politics together mm -hmm. um, and folks being like, I don't ever want to do that. So why would you ask me to do that thing? Um, and, and we tried to figure out the best way that we could broach it in a way that would both give people the opportunity to participate, but also, you know, if they were a little bit worried about, you know, having their personal politics kind of invade the gaming space or, you know, uh, kind of dig into to, to touchy subjects that might people my people might find as being taboo, that here's the first beginning step of making sure that everyone can participate in the, in the democratic process, right? It's like being able to say, even if I don't like your politics, even if I don't like you being, uh, you know, a, a liberal or progressive or, or conservative or any of those things in between, that I at least want you to be a person who can participate in the process. And I think that in and of itself is super important. So we decided that we're going to take two days. Um, we're going to stream on Twitch. It'll be on the Swanami uh, Twitch uh, uh, Twitch channel. Um, and and it's going to be a nonpartisan event. It's going to be a thing where. Anyone can uh, uh, can watch it. Um, feel like they're not necessarily uh, throwing themselves into the into the deep end of the pool politically, but also can feel like they are helping to kind of move democracy forward. You know, however you may feel about the current state of the world and the current state of the U.S., especially if you're here, I think that's the thing that everyone can rock with and say, you know, what we want everyone to be able to come to the table, no matter what those feelings may be. Um, and what we're hoping to do is we're hoping to, 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 to grab some folks from the industry and have them stream with us. Um, we, I think, I think I made it, might've gotten a couple of folks who we've been looking forward to having. I can't name it yet because we want to make sure before we do that they're locked in, that they want to do it. Um, but a lot of folks from the inside of the industry have been really excited at the process of po possibly joining us and doing it. So I'm excited, excited about that. I think we're trying to raise about five grand, uh, for vote riders, which will be, uh, a huge uh, boon to them because they need every drop of money that they can. Um, and yeah, it's it's going to be a fun weekend. Like all of our Spawn for Good efforts, we try to mix a little bit of, uh, you know, fun and, and excitement and entertainment with a little bit of um, uh, knowledge and, and, and gathering information for folks who might not necessarily know about uh, the particular uh, issues. Uh, but we want to make sure that people, when they come to the stream, they feel like they're welcomed. Um, we want to make sure that people kind of know what Vote Writers does and also, you know, again, get people into the polls because the midterms are going to be really, really important and making sure that folks at least have a, a say in, you know, how things work in the next election. Because there are so many ways that, you know, people are kind of pushing forward and, 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 and making sure that folks are, are continuing to do that work. So. Um, we hope people will come by and hang out with us during the weekend. It'll be the 22nd and 23rd of September. Uh, we'll probably be doing maybe 12 hour streams and break, breaking it up into, into chunks. Um, and we'll have more details, uh, through our, through our, uh, social channels. Uh, you'll see stuff on the small for good, um, small for good, uh, tag. And you also see stuff on the spawn on me, uh, Twitter page as well, or Twitter account as well about what's happening when it's going down and who's going to be participating. So super excited about that stuff. Thank you again for, for having me on and letting me chat about it, but it's going to be super dope. I'm excited for it. It's going to be fun to be able to get everybody together and like have people really excited about the, the process of democracy, which is a thing that you don't hear a lot of people in gaming talking about. So yeah, it'll, no, it'll be a lot of fun. It's so true. And I, I think that, 
that's something that I hope is unifying regardless of what our individual politics are or how you lean or which representatives you're looking to vote for. I think the important part is getting out there and flexing your civic muscles, right? Like Mm -hmm. taking advantage of the privilege and the right that you have as an American in particular to vote in this major election that's happening. Like you and I out there listening or watching may not agree on all of the policies and the platforms that we want to vote on. But what we can agree on is that everybody should take the time to learn about their their representatives, particularly on the local level. This is something I stress all the time that your local politicians have such a major impact on your life, so much more than the, the national politicians do that I don't care if you vote for somebody else, but I do care if you don't vote. And I knew so many people in our age group in particular, the 20s and 30s and 40s, who just abstained from the last Mm -hmm. election because they were like, I didn't have a candidate that I liked. And I was like, that's not you're not contributing to the process. And I think it's so important if you don't want to vote for somebody in one particular election, you shouldn't just not go to the polls at all. There's so many other things (laughs) that you can be involved in. And uh, I think it's awesome that you're teaming up with Sterling and that you guys are working to combat some of these crazy voter ID laws that we're seeing pop up across the nation to help make sure people are registered and that they don't have to go through any crazy hurdles, you know, that as American citizens, it's your right to vote. And no one should try to take that away from you and you shouldn't be prohibited in any way. And I think it's an awesome cause and I'm super happy that you guys are doing it. Um, we'll do whatever we can. Uh, again, like <laughs> our sincere apologies that the timing just lines up that we're out of the country, not going to be able to stream with you, but um, we're happy to get on board. And so let everybody listening and watching know what websites they can go to, what your social handles are, how they can get involved. Yeah, so we'll be on our Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash spawn on me uh, for most of the festivities there. We're still trying to figure out how to mix in folks who might want to stream just directly from their consoles and how that's going to work. Logistics are a fun thing to try to figure out when you're trying to put on an event. Um, but uh, most of the things will be there. Uh, we're expecting a fairly good amount of um, press from it, uh, so you'll definitely be hearing about folks who are going to participate. Um, and we're looking for people to stream with us uh, who want to be down. Uh, we'll definitely be making sure that you're not streaming some random stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, folks who are in the industry who listen to the show, please get at us. You know, DM me or Sterling on on. Uh, on our Twitter handles at Kajakins, K A H J A H K I N S, uh, and Sterling as well. I think it's Sterling underscore M. Um, and yeah, we definitely want to hear from folks. We want to make sure that again, everyone who streams with us as, as well is uh, feel safe while they stream. Uh, so we'll be having mods in in all of our channels uh, in our Discord, making sure that people feel comfortable and have ways ways to be able to kind of get help that they need. And also check out the stuff at Vote Writers because Vote Writers already has a great uh, uh, presence on on Twitter. But if you want to hear a little bit more about what they actually do before even the event happens, definitely check out their stuff on Twitter uh, as well. Um, and again, like this is a thing that I want people to feel like they have the ability to be a part of. Um, if you want to kind of fight apathy, this is a great uh, uh, event to kind of get uh, together with us with. And again, Small for Good is going to be a thing that we continue to do. It's not just this one-time event. So we're going to continue to do this uh, for more things in the future as well and hope to build that platform into something else that we can continue to hopefully do some good work in the world as well. So, yeah, thank you for for giving me the time to share it and also definitely come through and come hang out. Absolutely. Uh, Khalif Adams, thank you so much for coming on the show again. It was always great to have you. Again, don't forget to check out Spawn on Me. You can download it on podcast services around the world. You can also check them out at patreon.com slash spawn on me. Follow them on Twitter, and hopefully you guys will tune in. We'll, of course, be retweeting and giving out those links when the um, Spawn for Good event happens later on in September. And don't forget to check out everything we're doing at PAX West on whatsgoodgames.com. And we're looking forward to uh, seeing you guys, you know, in the chat on our first live panel. 
It's at twitch.tv slash PAX2 if you guys are getting this by Sunday, September 2nd at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And we will, of course, try to get that, um, that the video and upload it for you guys afterwards. But you'll always be able to watch it on the PAX channel in the Twitter, or excuse me, in the Twitch archives. Um, ladies, do you have any party notes before we say goodbye? Cricket. I no. was no 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 no. I was gonna say the happy hour Q and A, but I realized that will be done. Uh, done. Oh so I can't. We can't promote that. No, just look forward to episode sixty nine next week, the Britain Steiner show. Oh, 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 how oh, perfect boy. is that? <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> be more perfect. It's gonna be oh, so good. <laughs> so good. I'm excited. Steal your loins, ladies and gentlemen, for the Britain Steiner <laughs> show. Have a great weekend, everybody. They will see you next week. <laughs>